evening. I'd like to call um, the meeting to order and welcome you to the regular meeting of the Milwaukee Planning Commission. Agendas and additional copies of staff reports are available on the table in the hall. If you've not picked up an agenda, please do so. It contains important information about the process. If you wish to be included in the mailing list for a decision, please add your name and contact information to the sign-up list located on the table in the hallway. If you wish to testify, please fill out a yellow comment card and bring it up uh, here and we'll, we'll make sure that you are heard. We will follow the basic format listed on the back of the agenda. It includes all the hearing procedural steps. We may vary from the process based on the specific circumstances of each hearing. I don't believe we have any meeting, previous meeting minutes to approve tonight. We do not. Okay. Are there any informational items the staff would like to bring forward? Well, I have two. Um, one is that last Tuesday, um, the city council passed a resolution declaring a climate emergency, and in doing so, they um, moved up the deadline for uh, making Milwaukee a climate neutral city by five years. So the uh, target date now is 2045. Excuse me, could you speak up a little bit? Um, sure. Is the mic on? Is it on? No. I usually do a pretty good job. Perfect. I usually do a pretty good job. Am, am I coming through? No. Well, let's see where we are. Where we are here? Oh, there it is. Whoa. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Sure. Um, thanks for bringing that to my attention. The um, the other item I wanted to, to mention was that uh, right now we have an active open window for accepting applications for the Comprehensive Plan Implementation Committee. This is a, the committee that will take the Comprehensive Plan to the next step, looking at the code amendments that are necessary and any um, map or zone change amendments that are necessary. So that the way one would um, apply for that is talk to call the planning department and we can we can help you through that or if you're on the website to go to um, the the little bar on the top that says departments click on departments and then boards and commissions and that takes you to the application form um, those the deadline for that's February 10th and that's those are the announcements I had. I also believe that that is one of the uh, key featured uh, uh, things that slide across the top. So uh, if you wait your five seconds, it will probably uh, come right in front of you. No, it, it, well, it wasn't today. Oh, I thought so. I saw it on there. I'm checking right now. Okay. <laughs> That's what I've got. Okay, thank you. Um, this is an opportunity for the uh, audience to comment uh, on any items that are not on tonight's agenda. We are here to discuss the, the comprehensive plan, so that's tonight's agenda. But if you wish to comment on any item that is uh, on the agenda, there'll be time for comments after uh, the presentation. But I will open it up to see if anyone wishes to comment on an item that is not on tonight's agenda. Yes. Please come forward. Backseat driver. Hi, my name is Ken Kraska, and I have a, a presentation a little bit later about the comp plan, but I'd like to thank all you guys for all your hard work, and uh, congratulations on your chairmanship. Uh, I just wanted to qu uh, quote a few lines from a really great article I found uh, about zoning. Uh, so this is a general comments about zoning, uh, not about anything specific in this comp plan. An adequate, amount, uh, an adequate account of zoning must deal with the collective values zoning seeks to protect. Zoning is a device that protects a neighborhood from encroachments by land uses inconsistent with its character. The neighborhood commons will include other intangible qualities such as neighborhood ambiance, aesthetics, the physical environment, air quality, noise, degree of anonymity, or neighborliness. These features make up the character of a neighborhood. They are what give it its distinct flavor. Uh, in, a, 
addition to protecting the market value of my home and my consumer surplus in that particular piece of real estate, I will naturally want to protect those collective resources of my neighborhood that I care most about. These values can be almost priceless, especially for long-term neighborhood residents, many of whom are here tonight. Like one's home, one's neighborhood may be centrally bound up in one's definition of self and sense of his or her place in the world. And I'll conclude with this. Some neighborhood differences are simply inconsistent. For example, I might prefer a quiet, neighborly, low-density neighborhood of single-family homes with access to parks and schools. You might prefer the faster pace and excitement of a multi-unit apartment in a higher-density neighborhood featuring interesting restaurants, bistros, music venues, trendy boutiques. Yet my house and your apartment may have identical market values because some people are willing to pay the same price for my house as others are willing to pay for your apartment. However, some of the same neighborhood features that add value to your property in your neighborhood might detract value from my property in my neighborhood. Um, to some extent, the spillover effects on your individual property are different. Noise, traffic congestion, heavy pedestrian traffic are presumably of less concern to you. This illustrates that some land uses are incompatible with the neighborhood commons that current property owners have come to rely on. Okay, thank you, and I appreciate thank you, Mr. that. Prasca, thank you. Uh, the next agenda item is a public hearing on uh, file number CPA-2019-001. Uh, the public uh, hearing on this file, CPA-2019-001, uh, is called to order. The purpose of this hearing is to consider uh, legislative amendments to the comprehensive plan policy document. Uh, I will recognize those who have completed testimony cards. I have several here. Uh, uh, when you come to the podium, I would ask that you state your name and address for the record so that we may have those entered into the minutes. If you are here to testify, please remember to confine your marks to the application and the relevant criteria and to avoid repetition and irrelevant information. Uh, I would ask uh, that you limit your testimony to three minutes. Uh, we will be uh, judicious in the use of that, of that time, and if you uh, feel like you need a little bit more time to go over, we'll, we'll try to accommodate you, but we have a, a full agenda. Um, let me ask, uh, do any of the members of the Planning Commission wish to declare an actual or potential conflict of interest in this matter? No. 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 Does any member of the Planning Commission wish to abstain? No. no. Uh, let's proceed to the staff uh, report presentation. Okay, um, I'm going, Denny Egner, Planning Director, I'm going to start the presentation tonight and talk about um, a few things and then uh, perhaps um, City Manager Ann Ober would uh, make a couple remarks and then uh, David Leviton, Senior Planner, will provide some uh, comments on some of the changes that were being recommended. So what I wanted to talk about was the, uh, to start with, was sort of the next steps in this process. Process. Um, and then uh, a little bit about the deliberation process that we would expect the Commission to go through and then touch on um, two items that were talked about quite a bit last time diversity equity and inclusion those related policies and the Community Involvement Advisory Committee um, for the audience the shorthand for those diversity equity and inclusion is DEI and the short and for Community Involvement Advisory Committee is CIAC. So it's possible I might jump to those acronyms. Um, so to start, to start though, um, regarding plan implementation, what we are doing right now is talking about changes to the comprehensive plan that the city has been working on for over two years. And there, it's an outcome of the community vision, which is a year-long process before that. And we are moving towards, um, this is the second public hearing before the commission, and the commission will deliberate on making a recommendation to the city council. The city council will hold a hearing and adopt a document. <coughs> These are changes to the existing comprehensive plan policy document. We are not making comprehensive plan map amendment changes with this set with this work that will that will occur with the follow-up work um, which we will hopefully be starting this spring 
the um, and that's what I, I referred to the comprehensive plan implementation advisory committee process earlier and it is online Greg you're, you're right and checked she showed it to me it was there it was on the front page so um, uh, anyway that that committee will be advising about any potential zone changes restructuring of zoning and the, the types of protections that uh, perhaps Ken Kraska was was mentioning um, in his comments the um, uh, the first set of tasks that the um, Comprehensive Plan Implementation Committee are going to take on include those housing-related issues, housing-related issues that would um, respond to uh, House Bill 2001, looking at ways that the city can accommodate um, different types of housing types in its single-family districts. And the other thing that's really important to the community, as I mentioned, we just adopted a resolution related to a climate emergency. Our climate action plan includes a um, goal for creating a 40% tree canopy so that we've got uh, uh, trees that work to help with carbon sequestration. And we, um, uh, right now, I think we're in the like maybe 20, I don't know, I don't remember what the number is, but it's 24, 28% tree canopy, something like that. But I mean, it's we're talking about in planting lots of trees to get up to 40%. So um, that is a parallel task. We're gonna be working on how, t how do we increase the tree canopy while we're talking about housing um, issues. So we purposely match those so that we can um, work on them together. So that's the, the work for the next uh, nine months. You know, it's gonna be intense. Um, the next item I wanted to talk about was the what we were proposing for how the commission might approach deliberation. Um, after you get testimony tonight, you will be closing the public hearing, I believe. I um, you mean, know, the, the, the way we had sort of scoped this out was this would be the end of public testimony to the commission. Again, there would be an opportunity to make more testimony to the council, but... Um, um, then when you begin deliberation, we've provided you with attachment three, which was a sort of track change version of the policy document. And the policies, um, and we were going to encourage you to use that as sort of the, the outline, the format to work through, because that attachment three has a, num a number of the recommendations that staff has made. We're, we were suggesting we go through that entire document and then have the um, commissioners bring up other issues that they might have identified or the issues that have piqued your interest related to the uh, testimony that you received or the um, matrix of comments that have come in. The, um, the one exception there is um, section seven, housing related comments, and section eight, which are the land use related comments. We've received a lot of comments on those two. So um, I think what we've, what we've talked about is going through what Chair Massey and staff have talked about, is going through the entire document and skipping those two and then coming back to those two. So we can, um, and if Chair Massey wants to take a different approach to that, 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 that free to do so. But that was kind of what we had we'd thought about in advance. Um, so two other things I wanted to touch on. The, the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, options that w were in the supplemental staff report to you and the uh, comments about the um, <coughs> Community Involvement Advisory Committee. Regarding the... Um, uh, DEI options. Um, it, there were a lot. Of, there was a lot of testimony about that in the uh, at the last public hearing, and we proposed a, a, an option for you to follow, as opposed to building um, 
a recommendation into the comprehensive plan itself. The thought was to prepare a separate planning commission resolution to the council, basically recommending that they form a DEI committee that would look more broadly at land use, but to other issues as well, because so many of the comments related to this um, are bigger than just land use. Um, along with that, we proposed adding a policy that directed staff to basically, or directed the city to, to basically um, consider diversity, equity, and inclusion in zone changes, comp plan amendments, um, and those um, when appointments are made for advisory committees. So those were, and we've written up a draft policy and included it into attachment three. So those are, that was something that um, seemed like it would get at all the same issues that were being raised last time. Regarding the um, Community Involvement Advisory Committee, the um, discussion has been whether or not it should just be the Planning Commission, be a, an expanded version of the Planning Commission, or be an independent body that looks at you know, how we do um, community outreach and involvement. Um, Commissioner Burns had a suggestion last time, and again, when we spoke in the last week, and he repeated this to me, and uh, it just seemed like a, a really great solution to add some flexibility to this, and it would be that just have the policy stating that the council will appoint a CIAC, and that would then occur through resolution. So. It could be the Planning Commission on an interim basis. When the city has more resources, we could perhaps do a, a broader CIAC that looks at all aspects of the city, including Planning Commission activity and planning outreach. Or it could be a Planning Commission Plus. So it would, would give the council that flexibility to pick pick a choice and make it make a choice and, and have it subject to um, the, the resolution rather than a comprehensive plan policy. Much, much harder to change a comprehensive plan policy than to um, pass a resolution. So that flexibility seemed important. Uh, w w and with that, I, my, my comments are, are done. I don't know if, um, Anne, if you wanted to add anything. I think that if you're okay, I'd rather wait until you're in deliberations. And if you have questions for me at that point, or if you want to discuss the couple of options, I'm here to talk through that with you. Um, and if we go into this, I'll probably give you some background on sort of the council goal setting and what all the processes are right now around DEI. I think the only thing that I would add to Denny's comments in this moment is that uh, the the CPAC did an excellent job of making sure that DEI is not forgotten. There are 44 policies in that document that will make sure that we are holding true to the values of our community and that those things are being written into the new code. Um, staff has recognized that we don't necessarily have as much expertise as we would like in that, so when we go out to select a new consultant, we will be asking for them to provide us with a sub-consultant or a member of their own team who does have experience and also not only historical experience but some a strong plan for how they will implement this throughout our new land use so um, that is a graded criteria that will be in that RFP um, but that's I think the only thing that I would add at this time unless there are direct questions perfect so David will um, describe a couple of the other changes that were made in the document uh, hello, Commissioners, and I'm going to keep this real brief tonight, but um, we had sent out the packet originally last Tuesday on the 21st, and then we subsequently sent you out a revised packet on the 24th, where I believe we amended all of the documents and all of the attachments, so thanks for bearing with us. Um, I just wanted to point out, um, you'll see that you have received a number of additional public comments. 
above and beyond what you received at the first public hearing on January 14th. Um, in the original packet that was issued on the 21st, we had incorporated all the comments that we received through the 17th. Um, and then when we revised the packet and sent that out just on Friday, uh, this past Friday the 24th, um, we incorporated some additional comments. You've also received even some more comments um, that were received on the 27th and then just to make it more complicated, some additional comments that were received on the 28th. So you should have all of those in front of you. Um, so those will be really easy to look through, um, really easy to keep um, track of. But I wanted to point out just a couple of edits that we had made to attachment three um, and to attachment four. Attachment three being the matrix, and attachment four, uh, sorry, and attachment. Three is the, po three is the sorry. policies. Attachment two being the matrix and attachment three being the policies. Um, so as Denny mentioned, we um, would like to have a larger discussion of Section 7, Housing, and Section 8 later on, and so you'll see both in the uh, attachments 2 and 3, we haven't proposed really many changes to those because we wanted to have a larger discussion, especially on Section 8, because those policies were never pinned down by council resolution. Um, I did want to just call out a couple of the changes that we had made that are mentioned in the supplemental staff report from the 24th. Um, we made a number of changes to chapter three, which is uh, natural resources and environmental quality. Um, we're proposing changes to the overarching section goal, to goal 3.2, uh, policy 3.3.7, 3.4.4, 3.4.7, 3.4.5, and then kind of a related goal that's actually within section 10 is 10.4.10. So as we move through the various sections, and do our dis and the council, sorry, the commission um, discusses and deliberates these policies. I just wanted to make sure that those were called out there in track changes formats. Um, and if you have any questions about those or any of the additional policies, uh, we'll obviously be happy to um, aid in that discussion. Um, I also just wanted to point out before we get to the public testimony, um, there's going to be a large focus on the policy language, but we also did want to get your feedback on the document, the background sections, the introduction, the narrative, how it flows, the photos used. We got some really great um, input from Planning Commission on December 10th at your last work session before we shifted to the public hearing stage, but we still want to make sure that this is a document that is readable, that is easy to digest, that is... Um, you know, easy to, to sit down with um, and to really have it be a living document, something that we actually utilize. So we want to make sure that we get your feedback on those things as well. Okay, are there any uh, clarifying questions for the staff from the commissioner? No? Can I ask one? Sure. By looking at the audience uh, and uh, the amount of yellow cards that we have, is there a set timetable? I mean, can we continue deliberation on February 11th or uh, and make uh, the recommendation, or is staff looking for us to make that uh, recommendation uh, tonight? Well, we had we had targeted the first meeting in March for the count, opening the council hearing. Um, you know, we've just been, we've been working on this all a long time, and that meant that we were hoping that you would reach um, a decision on February 11th. I mean, it it sort of depends how much you guys need to change, you know, how much you need to do. So, you know, if we can't if we can't meet that date, we can't meet it. But you know, you need to give the council your best recommendation, but um, I would, uh, we can we can still deliberate on the 11th, but we were we were hoping we could make a, dis make a decision and recommendation on the 11th. If we have to push it out, we have to push it out. Um, do you wanna add anything about council agendas and schedules? I mean, they're, they're getting booked up. You know, the, the uh. 11.30 at night. <laughs> so part of why we're saying this is because the second meeting in March is going to 11.30 already. So we're trying to keep them uh, in some amount of rational evenings. Um, the first meeting with the comp plan is going to, I think, 11. So I'm, we're also trying to make sure they're, they're their best selves when they're looking at these documents and really thinking through the policies before they adopt them as well. Um, 
We also have an application that's currently pending with them. That's one of the things that they're going to be working on in March. So that's why we're aiming for that date. But like Denny said, I think it's appropriate. If you can't hit it, we'd rather have you spend the time that's necessary and we'll move things around. You've already described uh, additional correspondence that's been received. Uh, are, are there any other correspondence beyond the handouts that we have this uh, distributed this evening? Um, no, so you would have received the emails that we received on January 27th. I believe that there were three of them. Um, Renee Mook, uh, Elvis Clark, and then I forget the other gentleman's name, but those were all attached. Um, so there were those three on the 27th and the 28th, and then George Rudge was the third one. And then you also should have received the comments that we received late this afternoon from Mr. Kraska, and then also from uh, Planning Commissioner Edge. Um, those should all be on the dais in front okay. of you. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this point, uh, uh, we're gonna open up for a public testimony, and I'm gonna ask for, uh, I'm going to call up those who've indicated that they are uh, uh, in support, um, followed by neutral, followed by um, in opposition. So that's the, the manner in which I'll call folks up. Um, so I'm going to ask. Um, Ronell Coburn, is it Ronell Coburn? Yeah. Come on up. <coughs> yeah. Glasses here, glasses there, glasses everywhere. Again, we're going to ask you to try to limit your testimony to mm -hmm. three minutes, but we'll 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 be flexible. Okay? Would you state your name and Got address it. for the record, please? Yep. My name is Ronell Coburn. I live on Southeast 29th and Ardenwald between Boyd and Malcolm. And I just wanted to do a little follow-up after all the great discussion last time on um, community outreach issues. And I want to say thank you for those good discussions. I'm heartened by the discussions that are happening and the ideas that are coming up. Um, the first one is, uh, again, after all the discussion last time, it's clear that the Planning Commission by itself, by its own majority opinion, is not a body that can or really wants to handle broad and effective community outreach, education, and engagement. And um, in this matter, the size of our city does not matter. What matters is that our city engage in broad, effective, and inclusive community outreach and involvement, which it currently doesn't really have. Um, four of the six commissioners have now spoken about this in public meetings and have made it clear that they agree with this as well, that something needs to change, um, and that the body doesn't have the time, interest, or expertise to fulfill the CIAC role completely. Um, the second one is due to some repeated misunderstanding and sort of reconstruction of my input during planning commission and council meetings. I want to be clear that I do not think at all that a once or twice a year meeting about community engagement can create effective broad involvement. I think it needs at the very least to be something that happens monthly with whoever it happens with. Um, that once or twice a year thing is not creating effective broad uh, outreach right now and I wouldn't expect that it would do so in the future particularly speaking specifically about land use and transportation planning and I don't believe it would take an undue amount of resources to do something I like the ideas that I'm hearing Commissioner Burns um, and was that you David or Denny, I get mix everybody up at a certain point, um, about maybe in the interim having planning commission plus, uh, maybe in the future as we grow, having a standalone body, blah, blah, blah. So I'm really um, pleased about the changes or the proposed changes to the comp plan language to leave that more open. Um, I'm going to skip that one. 
in the interest of time. Um, the last uh, sort of point I want to make is that last time it was suggested that perhaps better city support of the NDAs could help fill the existing absence of plan coordinated community outreach for land use planning and transportation issues. But I strongly want to point out that the NDAs and the volunteer folks who run them have even less time, interest, or expertise due to the volunteer nature um, and the members' particular interests. Um, I did a quick audit of the NDAs and everything online available through them. More than half of them don't even have websites or any online outreach beyond the page pages on the city site. Things are terribly out of date. There's nothing across any of them about the comp plan, HB 2001, Hillside, proposed rezoning. There's nothing coming out of the NDAs that is doing true community outreach around land use and transportation issues. And again, that's not to fault the NDAs. I think it's just beyond their capabilities in the same way that it's beyond the capabilities of this body to do by itself. So I'm heartened that there are new ideas floating around about it and I hope that will continue because um, as you pointed out, I can't, you were sick last time, I'm getting over it. You know, it takes time, interest or passion and expertise all coming together and I think we've got it. It's just going to require some creative thinking to put something together that's really effective. So thank you. And thank you, um, Celestina, for the letter you wrote about the DEI and sort of the differences between a DEI and a CIAC, too. There's overlap, but they serve discrete functions. Thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, Ms. Cobo. So just so that everybody knows when you come up here, uh, uh, w when you got one minute left, the green light starts to flash, starts to blink. 30 seconds is the yellow. Just, I forgot to say that. I apologize. Did you know? <coughs> uh, Mr. Kraska, you have uh, additional comments on the um, agenda item? on yet. Shut off. Oh, we're waiting. Uh, it's just like say, I'm glad all these people came out. This is great to see everybody here and democracy in action. You can get that one to work. There you go. Well, I don't know what's going on. There we go. They're both up. Do you let your wife control the remote at home, Denny? Is that it? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay? This is kind of quiet, I think, in here. Is it okay? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Enable editing. That'll fix it. And then just hit, don't hit Enable editing and then slideshow. From the beginning. Okay, it's fantastic. Oh, you know what? I can just do it. Oh, I can do it. I can do it. Okay. 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 Enable editing again. And then uh, slide show from the beginning. There you go. Thanks. Okay. Thank you guys for spending the time uh, to hear me tonight. So I, I, I've printed out a bunch of stuff which is going around and it's very kind of detailed and technical as this kind of stuff is, so it gives me a headache. But uh, I have here uh, the logo, Our Voice, Our Vision, Our City. Whose voice, whose vision? Milwaukee residents, taxpayers, and voters. So let's not rush to a final recommendation. We heard that the city council's busy. Well, city council can also extend their meetings so that planning commission can have more time on this really important document that's gonna last uh, like 30 years. Uh, the state's given us two years to 
of June of 2022, so there's really no rush here. So I just introduced some of the other players who haven't really been mentioned here. Frank Angelo, he's the uh, lead guy at Angelo Planning, who is the consultant group for uh, the Milwaukee Comp Plan. So haven't met Frank, but uh, thank him for all, all the work that he and his staff have done. Uh, Mr. Johnson from South Carolina, responsible for the Monroe Street project, and uh, haven't met him either. Uh, but I have a few things listed there. Why are we building for people of the future when we're not taking care of those who are already here? Because that's where the profits are. That's a quote from Portland Rip. Uh, Thomas Brennicke, he's the guy who, de who was in charge of uh, Guardian Development, who developed the uh, lovely Axle Tree apartments right down here in, in Milwaukee. Uh, there's an ad from the Axle Tree. I went in there uh, curious about their units. There's a wealthy climate refugee. I added that to their pamphlet, but the rest of the pamphlet is, is normal. So we have a series of uh, wealthy white people here so far. Here's the uh, rents is approximately $2.60 per square foot. My house is, I think, 90 cents per square foot. So up to $25.31. I'll take questions after. I, I don't, really can't do that now. Uh, so here's a picture here. The most affordable house is one that's standing in the greenest house. You can't see the screen. There's two screens. Uh, the most, the greenest house is the one's already standing. So before we knock down all these wonderful 50s style, you know, uh, craftsman homes, <coughs> let's uh, think about that. Here's some pictures I took uh, two days ago, uh, or yesterday actually, in Selwood. Disproportionate scale, height, you see that? Solar access blocked, so do we want this? Do we want to be Selwalkie or do we want to be Milwaukee? Uh. Are we an extension of Southeast Portland? Or are we our own city? Cheap building materials, narrow side setbacks, fake brick walls. In Portland, the task of preventing more demolitions and creating affordable housing was tossed out in favor of providing incentives for developers to maximize profits by tearing down vintage housing. Uh, another quote from Portland Rep. Look at that nice wall there next to that house. The Great Wall of Residential Illfill, also known as M Middle Housing. Pay attention to this section, Comprehensive Plan Text Amendments. It may be approved by the commission here if it is in the public interest with regard to neighborhood or community conditions. So, is it? Get your yellow cards and answer. The public need is best satisfied by this particular amendment. More mismatches in style, skinny trees versus large. Skinny houses, housing built over the last few years has been mostly rentals. That is displaced longer term working class tenants. Our city is becoming whiter and wealthier. Is this really what we want? If so, then keep buying into these affordability myths. We want to be careful we don't conflate affordability and, and, and equity. I have many students of color I, that I work with in my classes and I have many friends who are from different races and religions. And for us to, it's like the Patriot Act, which took away all kinds of civil uh, liberties. Let's not misname this thing. Let's not conflate DEI with ROI. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is not the same as return on investment for wealthy de developers. I'm all for developers making a profit, but in the cottage cluster feasibility analysis study, they're considered a, a, a normal profit to be 16%. Well, the stock market's 8 to 10% in a good year, so they can make 8%. Here's the areas in pink, primarily, that they're planning to change to, from, uh, uh, to either high or medium density from low density. Now, the city will tell you they haven't made that decision yet, and they are putting off all of the significant decisions until the spring, uh, but this plan is still important because it, o it has all the overarching policies by which they will implement the code. And this was proposed by, uh, I think, one of the commissioners and was made up by the staff or a city consultant. So you can see there, most of the major areas, it, it, it's based on proximity to bus uh, routes. Uh, we're going to skip this because we don't have time, but there's our friend Denny, who is uh, also speaking on the controversy of increasing density uh, on either side of 32nd. And uh, then here is our friend, who get the last word, the uh, homeless Mission Park Cody. Uh, he didn't know what to do, and I don't know what happened to him. But let's, uh, let's think about that before we cut down these giant trees and say we're mitigating by putting up little skinny trees that take 200 years to get back to that size. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Grasper. Thank you. Chris Portolano. I don't think I can follow up after Ken Kraska. My name is Chris Ortolano, uh, 11088 Southeast 40th. Um, 
Rennell Coburn is going to be my AV assistant, and I know I've got three minutes. Um, Chair Massey, commissioners, member of city staff, planning, and members of the audience, thank you all for allowing us to continue our public comments with regards to the comprehensive plan update. As you can tell, a few of us have spent the better part of our winter holiday reading through this plan over and over and over. And I would like to suggest to you that there are some parts of the plan that are incomplete and some parts of the plan that are not very clearly stated. And so here's my ask, I'll be very clear. I would like to ask you to recommend that the CPAC reconvene with the leaders of the NDA to discuss one section in particular, which is known as section eight. It's the urban design and land use section. Okay, I have looked over the majority of the CPAC notes and I have noted that that concept of urban design, pardon me, was not very well discussed. We never had any planning commission meetings specific to urban design, nor did city council have a chance to pin down the urban design concepts. The reason that I am concerned and the reason that I wrote section 8.4 as an amendment is because of a comment that was made two weeks ago in this chamber during the public hearing process or after where our planning director suggested that we may be considering a new form of zoning known as form-based code. Now, I am not really sure what form-based code is, so I sent an email and I got a response, which is my right as a citizen. However, I can assure you that many in our community do not understand form-based code at all. It is a very sophisticated planning mechanism and it's not as black and white as we may all think because it can be overlaid with Euclidean code or Euclidean zoning. And so it is in the best interest of our community to reconvene the CPAC one more time and specifically invite the NDA leaders. I notice no new NDA leaders from our community. Last time there was only one here, Dave Ashenbrenner, who was not on the CPAC. Stephen Lashbrook was here. Where are the other NDA leaders that are needed to validate and endorse the changes that are recommended in this plan? Excuse me, they have a right to know. And we have a right to understand what form-based code means and how that will impact our residential neighborhoods. As I said on my, my, my sheet, am I done? I got 15 seconds. Continue. We're not opposed to residential infill. We are not. We want to do it incrementally in a way that supports the increased density, but does not compromise the quality of our neighborhoods, specifically to public safety. That's why we're here. That's why we keep showing up. Mr. Hammer, I support you in your efforts to really engage us. Mr. Massey, I support you in our efforts to come together as a community. Would you please reconvene the CPAC one more time? We've been working on this for two years, and two years prior to that, it was the vision. If we add two more weeks to this process, we can validate it. I don't think that's too much to ask and I would appreciate your consideration and your discussion with members of the management team and the planning team to give everybody a chance to understand what we're talking about here because it's complicated and we can figure this out together. Thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. I must say, it's fun getting to know you all. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ortolano. Eugene Trapp. I'm Eugene Trapp. I live at 9819 Southeast 36th Avenue, Milwaukee, Oregon, 97222. And this is Milwaukee, Oregon, not Portland. And um, <laughs> I was going through it, some of the things that happened, and I got some flyers on my porch and everything. And um, the first house I bought was in 1965 on Monroe Street. And uh, 
I, bought, I lived around Portland and Milwaukee most of my life, except for being in the service for a number of years. Uh, so there's some things I don't understand, and that number one, on the end of Milwaukee, not on the end of Monroe Street, but I think it's 70 something off to the right, there's over 150 acres of land, open land, with one house and a barn on it. So has anybody thought of building some properties there, some apartments there, instead of, excuse me, instead of in my neighborhood? I walk around this neighborhood just about every day, three to five miles. And a lot of things I don't understand, but I know that right now the traffic on Johnson Creek Boulevard is unbelievable. They travel that and they go up to southeast or Portland area. King Road is starting to get backed up also. So think about it. This is Milwaukee not Portland. Right. And also, if you increase these things, I can guarantee you, you'll be like Portland. You'll be a shooting, a knifing, or a raping every night. And that's what's going on in Portland. If you guys want to live in Portland, then go move to Portland. But leave Milwaukee alone, okay? Thank you for your time and effort. Thank you, Mr. Trapp. Uh, Barrett Kinney? So, Barrett Kenny, I live at 9992 Southeast 48th, right off of Logos Road. Um, I do not have all of the detail and information about the plan. I just have some comments I'd like to share with you about uh, how I perceive the plan. So, uh, I've got three things sidewalks, taxes, and transportation. So sidewalks, first of all, I think I'm not necessarily opposed to the infill. I think that growth is inevitable, but I agree we need to do it incrementally and we need to take into account the safety of the neighborhood, um, all of the comments that this gentleman in orange, I don't know your name, but that he made about how, how we develop and how we think about development. I think all those things are super important. Um, but there are no sidewalks, right? And I've got in my neighborhood houses with five cars in their yard, 10 cars in their yard, car lots, right? You know, it's like, where the heck are people gonna park if we bring all of this density, you know, first of all? And then how are we gonna keep our kids safe? You know, I've got a little girl. I moved from Southeast uh, Division. I lived in that neighborhood for 10 years and I moved because it was crazy the amount of uh, construction and the density and traffic and like you said my car got broken into multiple times you know it's just like there's a lot of things to consider so I hope you keep, you're keeping that in mind so uh, taxes the way that I perceive the way the plan is is being presented is that it will favor developers and defer their tax liability and push that burden to us the homeowners so I don't want that to happen. I want to avoid that, right? I don't want to create a scenario where developers are able to become slumlords and uh, bring my property value down by driving the rents of their properties up and having me have to pay for their services, right? Utilities and water and basically, um, I don't know what the right word is, but uh, sponsor their development through my taxes. So um, transportation, this was a big one, All right? So when we moved, we were super stoked, my wife and I, about the opportunity to um, leverage the MAX station at Tacoma. And that fills up by seven o'clock every morning. So there's no parking there and we gotta get our girl to school. So that's not an option for us. So now we're one of those cars, we're two of those cars congesting the streets. Um, so that's, that's a big issue. We can't go to Bybee because there's no way you can park anywhere near Bybee, right? To get on the next MAX line. You can't drive into the Brooklyn neighborhood because there's nowhere to park to get on the MAX there. So we've created a scenario where the only thing I can do is drive the other direction down to Oak Grove and try to get on the max there and there's no parking again. And now I'm driving the opposite direction for where I have to go to work. 
So I think these are, are critical things to take into account. The transportation is huge. We've got to figure that out. At the same time, our neighborhoods are cul-de-sacs by design to keep it quiet and keep it safe. So we've got to take that into account in terms of how we funnel the traffic through. So sidewalks, taxes, and traffic and transportation, that's my key, key points. So Thank you, Mr. Kenny. Thanks. Celestina DeMarco, tomorrow. Yeah. All right. Hello. My name is Celestina DeMarco. I live on um, 32nd and Olson. Um, good evening, commissioners and staff. Thank you for your time tonight. I did not anticipate attending both of the public hearings um, for the comp plan, but I am called to clarify my testimony. And gosh, now I feel like I should just throw a whole bunch of things in here, but um, I'm gonna try and keep it focused. Um, I submitted uh, some testimony early on. Uh, it's about five pages, so I'm just gonna summarize here in my uh, short amount of time. Um, I wanted to clarify the consideration that's before the Planning Commission, which is whether or not there should be a policy in the comprehensive plan that calls for the establishment of a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee, because I think that that got lost the last meeting. Um, for starters, um, the vision calls for us to implement a diverse, equitable, and inclusive city. Um, and the comprehensive plan is a set of policies that are the next implementation phase. They're not the final phase, but the next implementation phase for the vision. Um, Furthermore, in order to implement it, any kind of diversity, equity, and inclusion in earnest at our city will require dedicated individuals toward that end. Um, and as a result, there is no way that we can honestly be implementing the vision as it is as we are charged to at the stage of the comprehensive plan without calling for a particular identified body um, to hold the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, priorities um, for the city because no one else is able to do that at this time, um, either by expertise or by, um, or even by time um, in their schedule. So I also spoke, um, or I wrote in my testimony um, about how if we, because there was some um, concern at the last hearing, it sounds like staff has um, acknowledged that there is a need for this, but there was some um, concern at the last hearing as to whether or not we actually needed diversity, equity, inclusion as a piece of land use. Um, and so in 20 seconds, the history um, is that number one, land use has directly been used to oppress people in our communities. And number two, when it is not directly used to oppress people in our communities, the default is that it favors those in power. And so as a result, we need our land use to to actively be pro diversity, equity, and inclusion because being neutral is not being neutral and we've seen that in communities and cities um, for millennia. Um, as, as long as humankind, maybe we, I guess maybe we haven't been around for millennia, but for as long as communities have existed, that's the way it goes. Um, gosh, I also- Let's continue. Okay. Um, With regard to the proposal for the Planning Commission to um, have a separate recommendation to the city to establish a committee and then a policy in the plan that calls for diversity, equity, inclusion to be a part of all decisions. I understand that the thought behind this is to try and find a middle ground. However, one, I still haven't heard any actual reason as to why we're finding middle ground. I don't know why the answer isn't yes, we should have a policy to 
have a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee in our city, regardless of how we decide to implement that. So I don't know, I still don't understand why there's resistance in the first place, that why we should be seeking a middle ground. Um, but second of all, hiring a consultant, I do not find sufficient for a comprehensive plan for the next 20 years and how we're going to implement diversity, equity, and inclusion in our city. I think it's a great first step and maybe that consultant can help look at our resources and decide how to do that. Um, but to be frank, I, I just don't understand where the resistance is coming from. Um, I think it is required in order to adequately implement our comprehensive plan. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask a question, Chair? Yes. So, uh, um, and maybe I misspoke last time that uh, you came. Uh, what I, what my biggest fear is, is that the DEI committee is then, if we put it in the comprehensive plan, you are restricted only to land use discussions. Is that what you see the DEI discussing, or is it more of a broader topic? I, the, okay, the DEI does not have to apply only to land use, and I think the gap here right now is I don't know why the policy and the comp plan has to limit that committee's um, scope, um, only that it assumes that it will, the scope will include land use work. But for the land use portion of our, and of our work here as a city and for the comprehensive plan to say, in order to do this, we recognize that we need a dedicated body. And so that body is also gonna probably have to do a lot of work for the rest of the city. Um, but for us and for this, there's a gap here if we don't have anything. Um, so no, I don't think it's exclusive to land use. Uh, and what section would you put the DEI policy in I don't have a recommendation for you at this time but if you'd like it I could probably get it to you within 48 hours okay that'd be nice to know great I'm happy to do that thank you mr. Morrow thank you <laughs> Rob Gammon I think so you didn't do it Oh, when I was looking over, I was looking to see how to spell your name. Use the microphone or... Yes, please, and state your uh, name and address for the record, if you would. Actually, you the, the, mics, the mics that are in front of you should work. Okay. If you lean up. Yeah. My name is Rob Garman, and uh, we own property on Wake Street, uh, 3525 Southeast, and uh, we have a duplex there, and... Uh, um, Like the other gentleman said, it's it's ugly. It's really ugly. Selwood, what's happened there? We walk We've there all the what time. Has happened. It's it's sad. I mean, uh, you know this this but, business. Excuse of, me. Before we continue, would you yes, please give I'm us your name? Yes, I'm Anna Garman, Rob okay. Garman's wife. We live in Milwaukee and we own property there. We pay property taxes and we vote regularly. We also have seen um, what's happened to Selwood, and we don't like it. We don't like the pictures that we saw. Um, they're disturbing. They don't represent the kind of environment that we. Can, can I ask you guys? Would Would you want your house next to something like one of those? Would you want your house that you live in or that, that, that a property that you've sunk your life into and, and put work into so that, you know, for your retirement, would you want something like that next to your property? I have a couple uh, items. I mean, and and the, in this business of climate emergency, that just, to me, that's just, that's just corruption. So I have some issues that I'd like to, to, to express that are important to me. Um, the lack of sidewalks and potholes, um, yet there's bike lane development and it, it is in you know, a conflict with pedestrian safety. We have areas where we really need sidewalks and we're paying taxes for bike development. And I understand, you know, we've got a lot of people coming here we're going to have to provide housing for them, you know, um, but it just seems like there's um, a lack of balance here, you know. I don't, I don't like what's happening to Portland, and I can speak for a lot of my neighbors 
they don't want to be Portland. You know, they don't want to be a part of that. That's, we're different. And that's why we're here. That's why we choose to live here, because it's different. Um, developers create rentals, which can change the dynamics of our neighborhood in negative ways. Uh, just look at Selwood, look at how Selwood is changing. I've lived here in this area all my life, and I've owned property maybe 20 years here as well. And I don't like what's happening to Portland, and I just, I want to express that. Can I ask a question um, quick? Um, I just wanted to ask a question. Can you guys change this? I mean, even if you wanted to, are you guys capable of changing this, or are there forces above you? I mean, you They're think it's a joke? You're smiling. You're smiling. Do you think that's a joke? Do you think that, uh, you know, that's some sort of kooky thing? Oh, yeah, he's a kook. He's a wacko. I'm just asking the question honestly. Is it, It's an honest question. The, this forum isn't really set up to be a back-and-forth dialogue, and I apologize for having a smirk on my face. I, if I, I did have that reaction, it's because I was seriously it, considering the, the smirk question. smirk was not appreciated. Oh, okay. Well, I have another, I have another issue. So I um, appreciate that. We need more communication. <coughs> I just now learned about this. And that's why I'm here, because I care. I care about my neighbors, I care about my property that we have invested quite a bit in. Um, we need to be able to find out about this kind of stuff some other way, somehow. If it wasn't for the personal efforts of, of a, a very small group of people, we wouldn't have even known this took place. That's important because these decisions are gonna affect us for years to come. We have a right to know, however you communicate it, you need to do a better job because I didn't know and I guarantee you that many of my neighbors who I know well didn't know either. So I appreciate you listening to us and taking our feelings into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. and Ms. Garman. Michelle Greeley. Hi, I'm Michelle Greeley. I live at 2924 Southeast Malcolm Street in Milwaukee. I was born at 9147 Southeast 29th Street in Milwaukee. I lived there my life. My mother lived there for 60 years before she passed away recently. My brother lives next door to that, her home, and my sister lives three houses down the street. And the reason we all live there is because of the way the neighborhood is, was, and has been. I am, I'm, I'm completely overwhelmed and I'm gonna be probably a little bit scattered because there's just so many things I, I wanna say. And um, starting with, I am a founding member of the Ardenwald Johnson Creek Neighborhood Association. I was also a founding member of the Milwaukee Democracy Project, which, um, recalled the mayor and city council approximately 20 years ago for not acting in the best interests of those constituents. Um, and those things included a lot of land use matters. First and foremost, what's the flag lot issue because of the nature of the properties in Ardenwald. Uh, many of them are long and narrow or deep and narrow. I don't know how to adequately describe that, but that's why we, that was one of those. And the reason we were so adamant was because it affected directly our quality of life. We spent many years, I've spent many years, uh, fighting to keep my neighborhood high quality of life the way it is for my children. Well, I, and I've spent many, lots of time 20 years ago coming to these meetings and doing all this stuff and I was also raising children and I was running a business. Um, and it was difficult, but we, we meant it. And I think the council got the point. Um, also, I'm retired now, so I got lots of time to spend on it. <laughs> My kids are all grown up, so I'm thinking, but I just heard about it. And I'm, I've always been really well informed and I've always been really active until I retired after that. I was tired, you know, and I raised my kids and I did all that stuff and, and I don't know why. I mean, because I read the pilot, I do all that. I'm still there, but I don't, I didn't have any of this information until a new neighbor who just recently bought property in the neighborhood brought it to my attention. So clearly, there's no communication happening, and this is one is an issue years ago as well. Um, 
The, a mass mailing is absolutely should be absolutely required. There is no. It feels like you guys are doing stuff behind doors. It does not feel transparent. It does not feel inclusive, and it does not feel like you're acting on behalf of your neighbors. Um, I don't know what more to say at this point. I, I, I heartily agree with everything everybody said here in opposition. There's absolutely, I didn't spend all those years, and I, I've owned my house for 35 years. My mother lived across the street from me, or I lived across the street from her until she died. I didn't spend all those fights and all those hours and all these years keeping my neighborhood the way we love it to in my retirement have somebody pull the rug out from under me. I want to live out the rest of my life on my property and enjoy the quality of life that I have always come to know and enjoy. I just, I just can't believe that this is happening. Anyway, that's all I've got to stay for right now. I'll be back. I, I had a question for you, um, ma'am. Yes. Really? May, may I? Yes, go ahead. I was just wondering, do you receive the pilot? I do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. My three hundred dollar water bill. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, have a lot of uh, public testimony. Do any members of the Planning Commission have any uh, questions or comments regarding the testimony to this point? Okay. Um, I would at this point ask uh, the city staff, uh, do they have any uh, additional comments in response to the public testimony? Maybe a little. Go ahead. I, I guess I might respond to the, um, the last speaker just in that we did do a, a citywide mailing announcing the hearing. Um, announcing the hearing, that's not what I mean. I mean, you can announce at the hearing. Well, you guys are gonna, we, you know, asking for a recommendation to send this to city council in its final state. Are you going to well, consider any of our there, comments tonight? How can there, you possibly be looking for it? Can you, can you maybe a recommendation? Doesn't make sense to me. There were there were notices in the pilot that went citywide for our open houses where we did have lots of people attend those open houses. We had lots of people participate in the online surveys. Um, I'd encourage people in the audience to look at the website and look at that material where those things had come, come no, in. You're still not going to reach no, the, the I, I'm sorry, city but, by any of those means. But, that, but there has been quite a bit of outreach over this, the course of this project um, and lots of discussion with um, no. different folks. So, you know, it's not, um, we don't, we don't do door to door. You can't, I mean, that's just not the way it works. I mean, maybe, maybe in a, um, maybe it's something that would be an interesting way of approaching outreach if you could get that sort of network together to do that. But um, there would also be people that would be left out. I don't know. It, um, but any, but that was one one thought is we had recently done an, uh, a mailer to citywide we and it was in the pilot many times um, advertising every one of our outreach efforts, large outreach efforts. Um, I was just going to actually add that the comp plan is discussed and in, in this process is discussed in the last four pilots. I just checked through to make sure that I had that information correctly. But we do discuss it in the last four prior to. And, and it's been it's been discussed at you know multiple planning commission meetings that are broadcast on online. It's been discussed at multiple council meetings over the over the couple of years. Um, I don't know. We've done we've done a lot of outreach, and I think that um, I think we've done a really good job with our outreach, despite the fact that there are people in this room that, for some reason, didn't track it. Um, that the other thing I might the other thing I might notice the other thing I might note was that um, um, you know there's a lot of different things in the in the plan, and there were a lot of generalized statements that were made. They weren't focused on what is in the plan. Because there's not a lot of, there, I mean, there, the plan talks about creating opportunities for housing 
it doesn't say exactly how we're going to do that. The plan talks about exploring form-based options and trying to use form-based um, mechanisms to um, increase the, and they're intended to try to enhance the compatibility of new development with the uh, with existing development. That's the reason that concept is there. So, I, I mean, I. I think there are a lot of heartfelt comments tonight from folks, but I think there's a lot of information in the plan that um, addresses much of these what what people were concerned about. And I mean, we, we've got we've got our we've got a um, got a lot of work ahead of us. And how do we how do we create those housing opportunities that respect the the neighborhoods yet allow um, a greater range of housing options. It's a it's a challenge, but you know I think the community's up up to handle that discussion. Denny, would you uh, would you give uh, the you know the commissioners in the audience maybe just a, a quick description of the continuing work that will occur by the CPEC, which is a follow-on to the CPAC work. So uh, it's uh, it's it's a, a level of detail um, you know beyond what we have here, but there's still work to be done and additional opportunities for you know civic engagement. Um, there is. Um, there will be an advisory committee appointed by the council that will address the different types of code amendments, zoning code amendments that would be needed to um, examine how we accommodate different types of housing the different types of housing that we're talking about are single family, duplex, um, accessory dwelling units, uh, triplex, fourplex, and cottage clusters in different neighborhoods in the community. Much of that is driven by, um, you know, wh what those standards are going to be and how well they fit in, and then. The, and the corresponding part of that is, as I mentioned earlier, the the tree code related issues is how do we protect protect trees that are on these sites and how do we make sure that we're planting trees um, to ultimately achieve that 40% tree canopy. So those things together um, are the challenge over the next nine months. Um, the CPIC will, um, be looking at the, you know, where the code, um, where the where the code helps to do that, where the code prevents some of those things from happening, um, and even in the in the in terms of the tree protection, some of our code requirements really inhibit good tree growth, like even the setbacks between the streets, sometimes they're just too narrow, you know, so those are the, 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 the work could range from looking at the, that level of detail to, um, you know, plan densities for different neighborhoods. Thank you. Uh, I'll give the commissioners one more shot if they'd like to make any comments on the testimony that's been heard. I'd, I'd like to make a comment. Um, I really am apologetic that I was perceived as smirking. I, I, I know I reacted and um, I thought it was more of a, an internal I, I, reflection on this notion that are there powers that be that kind of are forcing our hand or pushing this through. And the truth is there aren't. Um, we're volunteers. We often disagree with each other. Um, we often, uh, and we're very, in fact, influenced by the folks who come and speak to us. And we heard a lot of impassioned testimony, and I know you're my neighbors, and um, it influences me and it influences this body frequently. And I think that's a great thing about this city that does differentiate it from Portland. And it's one of the things that 
makes this a place I want to call my home, um, that there is an opportunity to participate and that your voice can be heard and that this is a community. I'm waiting the passioned, impassioned testimony I heard from the 10 or so folks who came up and uh, expressed their fears and their concerns, um, the 25 people who are in the room today. And I'm waiting that against the, uh, the two years of process that this board, this commission went through, um, the, all of the meetings that came before this. And uh, that's a lot of weight. And that's the weight that I'm gonna have to process as I hear the, um, the tensions today is is yeah you guys are you guys are passionate and you have some well-reasoned concerns and um, I'm sorry that folks haven't been tracking this process but the only thing um, that is going to weigh on my deliberations and my concern is the fact that this has been going on for a long time and there's a lot of other people who have been participating in shaping this and um, some for and, and some against and so that's uh, how I'm going to approach this deliberation and I think everybody I said that I am I am going to consider the testimony here because uh, that's what Milwaukee does and that's what this commission does. So thank you everybody for testifying. Chair Massey, you also asked if there were any other staff comments to other components of what's been heard. Um, I am happy to speak to both the, um, the Community Engagement Committee and the DEI Committee if you would like me to do that now. Um, does that help? Okay. So, unfortunately, it's going to take me a few minutes, which is why I was holding till after the public testimony. If at some point you decide you'd like me to go back to holding, feel free to let me know to hold. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, so, I wanted to start by explaining a little bit about how I interact and how staff interacts with council. And it's important because it's important to know what the role of the, the people sitting up here are versus the people who are going to be making these decisions with all of you. Um, so first and foremost, we, we have policy ideas, but those policies are set by council. And we take our policy recommendations just as you do, just as the community does to the council. And uh, they create goals. So we did that through the visioning process. We created this community vision. We said this is who we want to be. Council then set goals based on that vision about what things do they want to tackle first. Um, it was a 20-year vision. It was something that we knew was going to take time and it was something that we knew we didn't as a small community have the resources to be able to address everything at once. And I come from a long-standing leadership trend that says if you try and do everything at once you get nothing done. So trying to contain it to a few key big goals that council really felt was important was a critical part of our interactions with between staff, me, and the council. Those goals right now are housing affordability, climate, and community engagement. And I bring this up for a couple of reasons. One is in our budget process, those three things get money. So it's not enough for us to say these are important. We actually invest a lot of cash and a lot of uh, staff time. Those three uh, goals also have staff associated with them. So we're investing a lot of resources to try and make sure that those things are accomplished. Um, in the community engagement goal right now, we're actually doing an audit of our engagement. Uh, so the reason that it's hard for us to say is a committee the right outcome is because that is a tool before we have what the outcome is that council is looking for and before we know where we're at. It's not that staff is recommending or not recommending doing a committee. It's that we're about to sign a 20-year document that binds land use without having that outcome completed and we're asking for a little bit of flexibility so that council can actually figure out is that the right tool to get us what what their goal is asking for and what the vision is asking for. So it does not mean that you all have to follow suit. This is a recommendation to council, but I wanted to at least give you a sense for why you're getting some concern from staff. It's not that we're concerned about the committee per se, it's that we're making sure that the tool is the right fit for the thing that we have a problem with. The second one is actually the DEI piece that I wanted to talk about brief briefly. Um, I want to actually echo what Celestina said. I do believe that in land use there is a huge amount of racism and inequality that has occurred over the 
she said millennia. I don't think that's quite it, but it's been a long time uh, since we really started doing this kind of work. And I think that um, when we started this work, we actually read the color of, a law, of law as a team to understand what that historic racism is and to understand the grounds that we were starting from. There's no one on staff that disagrees that that is a huge problem that needs to be addressed in this process. So I wanted to just make sure you also know that there is no question about whether or not we're in alignment or whether or not council is in alignment with that concern. Um, the issue for me is actually a few things that did come up. The first is that the comp plan is the next step in the vision. That's not true. That's not actually correct from the perspective that is one arm that comes out of the vision. There's actually a whole bunch of plans that come out of that document. This is the land use one. It's not that there aren't a whole bunch of others. I talked a little bit about the community engagement plan we're working on right now. That one will look at whether or not we're reaching the audiences that we need to reach and we have an outside auditor doing that work to make sure that we actually get um, data that isn't biased by us that says how are we actually doing uh, instead of us making assumptions about how we're doing. So that's one argument. One of the concerns that we have is that this is not actually a land use function. The, the committee itself doesn't belong in the comp plan. It's not that the committee itself shouldn't exist. So when, we have, when we've separated these two things, it's to give you a chance that, yes, you're planning commissions, but you're also advocates for your community. We respect that your hat doesn't stop just with caring about land use. You have other passions that you may want to talk to council about. We're asking that you separate the land use component from the other passions you may have. And if you want to ask council to create something like a DEI committee, that you do it outside of this document just because it's not necessarily where it should sit if that makes sense. So um, that's one piece that I wanted to put out there. The second is um, that there's also a comment that this would require a lot of staff time and focus. Yes. That goes back to the original statement I made about goals. It's a lot of time, it's a lot of focus. When we set a goal, we hit it. I'm kind of a believer in that here at the city. Uh, so when I take on a project, I try and make sure we deliver it to you and to the council. And so I just want to make sure that, that they only get three of those each year because we need to be able to deliver them. I need them to make a decision about whether or not this one should replace one of the other three. Does that help? Yes. Isn't a DEI community involvement? It is. But again, that's one part of DEI. So what I'm trying to say is actually DEI exists far outside of community engagement. The community engagement is looking at DEI within its plan, just as you all are looking at DEI within your plan. This isn't saying, um, it's saying which one is the primary and which is the secondary piece that's coming out of it. Right now, you have a secondary piece. DEI is coming out of your plan. There's 44 policies that we will be implementing that implement the DEI goal for the comp plan. Um, in engagement, same thing. We'll be looking at whether or not we're reaching communities of color or of diversity and whether or not we need to be changing how we actually reach out to them instead of expecting them to come to me. Does that make sense? So we're trying to make sure we use the right tool to maximize the engagement. But yes, we'll be looking at that there too. I, for full transparency, I also have a staff group right now who is their own committee who's looking at some internal pieces for DEI, for our hiring practices and for some other pieces. So I'm, uh, when we did council's goal setting, that was actually my personal goal, was that I wanted to have their support looking internally at how we do our work. So they have agreed to put some funding in the budget for me this year so that we can actually try and accomplish that arm of the DEI goal. So yes and. There's absolutely a, a place for DEI in all we do and we are incorporating it into those pieces. Anything else for us? You mean that wasn't enough? <laughs> absolutely, if you, I'm gonna stay tonight, so if you yeah. have other questions once we get into discussion, I'm happy to talk about these further. Okay, appreciate that. And Chair Massey, if I could touch just Please on do. one thing, just related to what middle housing is, and that's been a lot of the focus of the policies and the development within section seven and section eight. So 
Middle housing is not large ap apartment complex. It is, it is not four story apartment complexes along Milwaukee Avenue or 17th Avenue in Selwood. It is duplexes, it is triplexes, it is fourplexes at the high end. It is cottage clusters, which are small cottages around a common open space. Um, so I can understand the fear and the frustration with uh, members of the public if they think that there's gonna be a four story apartment building on every uh, street in Milwaukee. Um, that hasn't been the discussion. Our medium density zones within the city of Milwaukee allow for up to two and a half stories or 35 feet. That's the same as our single family, our low density residential uh, zoning districts and neighborhoods. Um, you know, we're not going to be allowing, we're not proposing to allow three story apartment complexes with unlimited heights in every neighborhood. Um, so I've heard a lot of reactions that I think come from that being the understanding. Um, if I'm wrong and people are opposed to any increases in density, inclu including duplexes and triplexes, that's obviously something that we're going to need to discuss. Um, but I want to make sure that the community is aware of what we're talking about when we're talking about middle housing, especially the state mandate through House Bill 2001. It is not large apartment complex. It is not the images that Mr. Kraska showed of a single family home right up against a four story apartment complex. Yeah. And so I just wanted to get that out there. Oh, I just came to Anything else from the staff? Yeah, a question for you if it's possible. Uh, I'll allow one question before we uh, close public testimony. I'm Eugene Traffic yet. Yeah. You come up to the microphone. You've got to come to the microphone. Okay. I'm Eugene Trapp, and I was up here a little bit ago. I walk all around Milwaukee. I've been here most of my life. And the apartments in Milwaukee, the actual town of Milwaukee, they all have parking lots. They all have parking areas on 32nd Street, on, uh, on Harvey, on uh, all the way down King, uh, not King, yeah, King Road and the other places. They all have parking areas. And what I understand is if they start building these places, there's not going to be parking areas. The people will be parking on the streets. I mean... I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I could, it, you know, that doesn't make sense to have them park it on the streets where the, where the streets are narrow here and there's not room for people to park or if you can only park on one side, because uh, on Harvey, you can only park on one side of the street on all of Harvey. So the parking isn't there. So anyway, that's what I had, that's the only thing I have to say. And once again, you start increasing people here in Milwaukee, you're gonna to have to start increasing the police department because I guarantee you, there's gonna be murders, there's gonna be rapes, there'll be <coughs> knifings, and you'll be a little, a little Portland. And Portland at one time wasn't like that. I, li I lived in Portland, we came up in Vanport. And so I lived there and I know what it was like in the old days. And there wasn't any murders and there wasn't any knifings. You know, it was unheard of. And now, it goes on every night. So, think about moving people in here. Why don't you just leave, let Oak Grove or Gladstone or uh, Damascus or somebody else build? Why are we building, uh, why are we uh, building out? There's no need for it. Let Portland keep building. They're, uh, they're building uh, apartment houses, and I checked into it. Believe it or not, 93% of the apartment houses that they built are empty. They're empty, nobody's in them. They're standing idle. So why are we building, trying to build Milwaukee? Let other people build it. Leave us alone. Transportation. Leave us alone. Thank you for that additional testimony. So I'm about to close the uh, public testimony portion of this hearing. I would remind everyone here that uh, that when the uh, city council takes up uh, the comprehensive plan, there will be additional opportunity for public testimony at this point. But I'm about to close the public uh, testimony, and we'll uh, proceed to uh, uh, discussion of the uh, comprehensive plan by the Planning Commission. So uh, the public testimony portion of this uh, uh, hearing on uh, file number CPA-2019-001, the comprehensive plan policy document is now closed.
So commissioners, we're uh, going to proceed uh, to uh, discussion and I would like to uh, sort of reiterate uh, uh, a general plan here to see if there's a, a concurrence or some other ideas. But I think that we have, um, uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, we have a, a schedule to meet. Um, I don't think that that schedule is uh, written in stone, but we've got to get there at some point, okay? So I think that we, uh, we have uh, some areas I think that um, are going to need additional discussion. I think that we have some areas that uh, are less controversial that we, we could get through with the idea of trying to pin down as many sections tonight as we can, uh, try to get to the more um, contentious issues, I'll call them. Um, maybe that's too strong of a word. Uh, so my suggestion would be to try to get through section two, three, four, five, six, nine, 10, 11, and 12. And then if we can get through those, we can come back to section one, community engagement, section seven, housing, section eight, urban design and land use uh, time permitting. Does that sound like a reasonable approach and we would use um, attachment three Chair, as Chair, our guide? Chair Massey, uh, uh, we should take a, uh, um, advantage of having uh, City Manager Ober here uh, this evening. Yeah. Uh, and um, because I believe uh, section one and the DEI uh, um, questions that we're gonna have, uh, she may be able to uh, help us answer and clarify. So um, I don't know how long it's gonna take us to get through everything besides um, seven and eight, but I would not wanna miss out on the opportunity of having Ms. Over here to answer some questions for us as well. Commissioner Hamer, you can't get rid of me. I'm staying all night. I'll be here at the rest of the meetings until you all adopt the comp plan. I wanna make sure that if there are pieces, whether it's this or something else that you have questions about that I can address, that I'm available. I realized after watching the last meeting that this was a big enough deal that y'all could probably use insights from me on different components. So I will be here. Thank you. Yep. So maybe what we can do is try to get through those sections that I proposed earlier. Uh, and then as uh, we see the, the, the clock move, we may shift to the other areas that the city manager might uh, give us some insight. Would that be acceptable? Yeah, I also have a question about um, uh, the zoning, uh, which was the first page of uh, attachment three. So um, uh, if we could cover that uh, maybe tonight as well, that would be wonderful. So b before we get to that, um, I was gonna, the um, <clears throat> the supplemental staff report from the 24th, um, the uh, approach for deliberation was to um, go through the key issues identified in the staff report first. No, it was to go through the... Oh, to go through the whole, through the track changes three, document first. And when okay. key issues come up, address okay. them Very good. as they come up. Commissioner yes. Massey, right. your, right. Right. Your, your Chair Massey, your plan sounds good to me, yes. and uh, I, I wouldn't be able to tell this was your first hearing as chair. <laughs> You're doing a great job. Young. Thank you. The night is young. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. There is, a, there is a comprehensive plan use designation. I had that on my list. It just didn't have a section number, so I, 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 I left it out. So I think we'll start with that very first page in attachment three, which is the comprehensive plan use designations, and I'll just open it up for any discussions. So I do have a, a question for staff under the high density. Um, uh, haven't we been talking about making R1 and R1B the same? And could you please explain briefly what the difference between those two zones are? So R1B and R1 are generally the same. R1B has uh, some additional commercial uses, specifically office uses that are permitted. Um, they tend to be a little bit closer to 
uh, the downtown core. Um, and so that's the first question as far as what the difference. As far as combining zones, um, if you look at the top, um, kind of the couple paragraphs at the top, it notes that we're planning on update, actually going in and updating and looking at potential changes to the zoning designations uh, following some of the code work that we do as far as House Bill 2001 implementation and other proposed changes to the zoning map potentially, but more specifically to the zoning code. Um, so we weren't proposing any consolidation of zones at this time. We wanted to have a larger discussion during the implementation phase, which would be post-policy adoption as far as how many zones do we really need in a city of And so that would go 000. for the CG and the CL and all Correct. of those? Correct, yeah, there's, a, okay. you know, there's preliminary discussion of getting rid of all of those commercial uses and having more like neighborhood mixed use zones um, and, and that much, but we wanted to have a full discussion of that before we started proposing any changes and we'll come back and amend the comp plan as needed. There was one. There was one change in here that you described last time, which was matching the comp plan density with the actual zoning density. And that I don't know if you have further questions about that. But there, there really weren't a lot of changes in this section that were being proposed, other than other than that. Yeah. Just to reiterate, the only proposed change within the R1, within the high density residential land use designation, is was to the density ranges um, in the current version of the comp plan. It's 21 to 24 units per acre. That didn't match our uh, zoning code, which the R1 and R1B have a density range of 25 to 32 units per acre. Um, I would need to look back as far as the legislative history of all the past code amendments to see kind of where that happened to that change, but basically state law says that our comp plan and our zoning code uh, need to be consistent. We've actually, in the good old days, been sued for not having it that way. Uh, so we wanted to make sure, at least in the interim, that the, the zoning matches. I think we covered that last time. Yep. Any other comments on the comprehensive land use designations? No. None. Okay. Uh, I think we're, I would like to skip community engagement for now. We'll come back to it. And uh, let's go to section two, history, arts, and culture. Uh, I have one comment, and it is a technical one in the overall section goal. The second line reads, spaces that celebrate Milwaukee's diversity and it unique historic. It should be its with an apostrophe S. I think it's no, no apostrophe. No apostrophe. No apostrophe on the possessive. Oh, no, no. Okay. Good catch, though. There's a comma on policy 2.1.4. 2.1.4. I don't think that's what we're here for, though. <laughs> no, I think we should move on. Any other comments on section two? None. Um, no. Wait a second. I know, it's hard. Did you have anything, Commissioner Edge, or review? Um, very nice for your package there. Well, I just I wanted to get make sure that I'm looking at the comment matrix. Okay. Um, you know, as we're. I think that's a good point. Is that uh, you know, the, the only public comment um, in the matrix as far as uh, section two um, relates to the Milwaukee Museum not being on historical uh, inventory, and so that's um, kind of outside the scope of this. So we can move on. Okay. Uh -huh. So we're going to move on to section three, natural resources and environmental quality. Um, I just generally want to say that the um, the changes proposed by the North Clackamas Watersheds Council are um, are based on the latest science, and um, it uh, this is this is the time to try to you know incorporate those kinds of uh, policy recommendations, and so those are. My read is that the uh, those comments from the from uh, from that organization were were incorporated. Yes. Yeah. So Agreed. yeah, in, in the supplemental staff report, we've addressed that and what our recommended changes are. Okay. In policy 
Is regulatory hierarchy in the glossary? Because I don't know what that means. It sounds like it's well those guys. Well, no, it it's I th it's just referring to that the process of avoid, minimize, mitigate. That might be a nice thing to put in the glossary then. Um, or or, or explain it out or drop it. Statement. Um, it's just that. Uh, we were, um, I, I don't remember what the original language might have been, but we've used maintain in instances where we, it's not develop, it's not create, it's, we've, we've got this regulatory hierarchy of avoid, minimize, mitigate, and we believe that's a good approach to take when looking at these natural resource areas. Um, there might be another way of saying it. Well, it sounds like that regulatory hierarchy is a thing. It's used as a noun in that sentence that says that that is what determines all of this. And I just don't know what regulatory hierarchy actually is. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it comes from the state and metro levels that basically provide the framework for cities um, through things like Title III and Title 13 of the Urban Growth Management Functional Plan, as far as that being a metro document, um, and others as far as, and then statewide planning goals as far as that you should be, be trying to avoid and minimize and um, the hierarchy is simply referring to avoid, minimize, mitigate in this sentence. It may not be the best sentence in the world, um, it, but it's not referring to something. Hierarchy just means that it, this is the, the preferred way to, to, you know, to tackle these is to avoid it first of all, minimize yeah. it second, and mitigate it third. It's not, it, it's not implied that there's this state metro city regulatory hierarchy here it's internal to this well, so so why wouldn't it be maintain cities uh, and that's my overall comment for this document in front of a proper name do not put a participle maintain cities uh, requirements of a detailed analysis including alternatives how development will avoid minimize and mitigate for impacts of natural resources well you could just put in process make maintain the city's process that requires a detailed analysis or you could say require a detailed analysis including I mean, there's a number of different ways we could say this, I suppose, to simplify it. If the, I mean, if the phrase regulatory hierarchy doesn't really add anything to it other than confusion, I think um, Denny's suggestion of just starting with require, at require, striking everything before that would Which be, policy basically gets it the same. Uh, 3.2.4. If it were to read, just require a detailed analysis, including alternatives of how development will one avoid, two minimize, and three mitigate, then right. And so, if you if you look at the mm -hmm. comment that or the the revised uh, chapter seven that I submitted um, earlier today, that's that's really in the spirit of what I was trying to accomplish. Is that these should be really simple, declarative. Um, instructions and so um, you know not having a lot of extra words and the policies but you know just what is the what what are we doing what action are we doing from this and so um, starting at require I think is is certainly in the spirit of that approach of trying to simplify the the language and make it very legible and staff would support that if that's uh, direction from Planning Commission and then Policy 3.2.8. Let's just let's oh, kind, of, let's kind of nail this one down. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I like the suggestion from staff to get eliminated. Agreed. Okay. So it just says start off with a re require a detailed analysis and continue the sentence. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. No, no, no. That's good. Every now and then someone has to tell me to be quiet. <laughs> Uh, uh, policy number 3.2.8, um, that second sentence that, in, that is in there, uh, it seems like it's a separate goal. Establish the city's preference for sustainable stormwater facilities that utilize natural systems and green technology through the use of incentives as well as code changes. Was there a reason why that that got 
That's the stormwater policy, right? Right, improve stormwater detention and treatment standards through the use of best available science, technology, and management practices to meet water quality standards and achieve wildlife habitat protection and connectivity goals and standards, which sounds like a good policy. Then another good policy would be to establish the city's, establish city's preference for sustainable stormwater facilities. In the spirit of um, simplicity and legibility, I do agree that those, you know, could be split apart and would be easy, more easily readable. It's whether or not the organization of having 3.2.8 encapsulate the entirety of the stormwater policy for this section um, or for this goal is appropriate or whether splitting that off into two separate policies would, would be um, appropriate. So you're saying you could get just get rid of the second sentence? Well, I think, I mean, you'd, no, you'd either, I mean, it, it's it's kind of, I don't know if our goal is to say, look, 3.2.8 is the stormwater policy in this, in this section, in this, for this goal, and then leave it at that, or if we would have two stormwater policies. Oh, I see what you're you saying. Know, and then you'd, you'd have, you'd, you know, you'd split it into two. I don't know what is preferred, necessarily. Um, I tend to err on the side of keeping things simple, direct, and legible. It seems as though it just needs to incorporate the utilize natural systems in the first statement. I'm not sure if in other places we talk about the use of incentives as well as future code changes. That seems like a, a reach of the document. So could the first statement be reworded to incorporate, incorporate excuse me, natural systems? And green technology. Which seems to be best available science and technology, but maybe that's arguable. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, yeah, so just put in improved stormwater detention and treatment standards to the use of best available natural systems, science, technology, and management practices, right? Correct. We have that? No, I didn't get it. Would you try it one more time? Sure. So I believe policy 3.28 as being discussed would read, improve stormwater detention and treatment standards through the use of best available natural systems, mm. science, no? Best available science. It's kind of its own. Green part. technology management practice and natural systems to meet water quality standards and achieve wildlife habitat protection and connectivity goals and standards, period. Yeah, it's, it's the question of whether it's a different thought or a different, you know, a different directive to um, establish a hierarchy that prefers, that favors um, sustainable stormwater facilities that use natural systems and green technology versus um, gray water systems or other um, non-natural. And this did come through, I mean, I think that the, the, I think one of the motivations for this was an actual land use application where we um, ended up, you know, recommending that they go with the stormwater that was, you know, under the parking lot instead of encroaching into the WQR. Um, and so, I mean, our, our preference is, you know, the natural systems, but there is a time where we might say, you know, actually, we don't want you to encroach on the buffer. We'd rather have a gray water system in this in this particular case, and so it's, it's there is a hierarchy there. There is a preference there, and it's just the question of whether that's a separate thought from the first half of that policy. Is it a distinct enough thought that it warrants breaking it into a, a separate policy? I, I, I think it, that they are separate thoughts, and I would advocate for two policies. I'm fine with that. Okay, so uh, is it simply <laughs> taking the second sentence and putting it into, into another paragraph? Is it as simple as that? Or do you want to... Is that complete enough on its own? Um, I just want to uh, give the city enough to, you know... Well, I would think so, that it... Uh, uh, like I said, you either incorporate it with the first sentence I, or you just make it, it on here. I think it reads okay. Just, yeah, we can split it into two. Okay, is that understood? So we'd have another, we'd be renumbering and splitting. We just make this one 3.2.9, the second sentence 3.2.9 and renumber the other two. Yeah. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, continuing on section three. I have one for uh, 3.4.4. And so, uh, um, is Urban Heat Island uh, gonna be in the uh, glossary? We can add that, yeah, this was a, one of the later editions, so we haven't updated the glossary. And, and uh, so, and I, and I just, for my own clarification, I thought like a heat island was something um, like you have five houses uh, kind of packed together all with black roofs that are causing a bunch of kind of heat and blah, 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 so you want to throw some shade on there to kind of cool it down. Am I understanding that correctly? Like a lot of blacktop in an area, is it a heat island? Uh, it's not, I mean, it's not limited to blacktop. It's the general concept of it being a very highly developed urban environment with, especially when you, if you're factoring the lack of tree canopy, um, you know, it's why downtown Portland is warmer, stays warmer at night than say Hillsboro. Um, you right. know. So uh, what I, so then th when I got a little bit, so when I read this, uh, it says prioritize increased tree canopies in areas that are currently canopy uh, deficient. Then it says subject to, uh, subject to urban heat islands and low air quality. Now that I see the comma, it makes a little bit more sense. Uh, the wrong version. But it, but it, it seems that it's kind of an added thought that doesn't quite jive with the whole entire sentence that way you're getting at. So, I mean, we can continue to work on this. This was based, um, I believe, on a comment from the North Clackamas Watershed Council. No, I think it's a good trying, trying to incorporate it, and I, I think we were trying to incorporate it into an existing policy. So, if we shoehorned it into a place where maybe it would be more appropriate someplace else, or if the language needs to be revised. Well, the, the, the word like instead of subject, it, you could say prioritize increased tree canopies in areas that are currently candidate def deficient, like urban heat islands and low air quality areas. I was, was going to suggest to substitute um, for subject to use the word vulnerable. Oh, there you go. That's not a bad word. So um, areas that are currently candidate to be deficient, vulnerable to urban heat island effect and low air quality. There you go. That's a good word. Okay. Continuing in section three. So, um, so on three, four, five. Um, where else do we use the verb strengthen? in this document. I couldn't find it. I would have to, yeah, look through there. And so um, I'm, I'm, I'm really going to obsess over being deliberate about the verbs that we use because these are directions. And so uh, yeah, I think that we should be consistent, um, you know, um, and if it's the right verb, then it's the right verb and that's fine. But, um, but I, you know, it, when, when we're trying to be consistent and then we change a word that we use a lot and replace it with a word that we don't use anywhere else, I want to know why. And I don't know that we're changing, I don't know that the, the, the use of, of either of those alternative verbs changes the meaning of that policy in any way that justifies using a word in one place inconsistently with the rest of the document. So I guess my, and right, uh, do we currently have any protections for existing native species and climate adapted trees? On private property, uh, if they're not within natural resource areas, no, and not specifically for those types. So whether it's enhance or strengthen, it's largely, I don't know if it would need to be a, even a different. I mean, verb. I would honestly prefer the word implement, but. Or create or. Well, you could say create and implement. Implement encapsulates the create, I guess. And I guess the only issue is that implementation is obviously typically through the development code. So we've it could tried be not to try implement and through the zoning, uh, zoning ordinance. Okay, just this one. Yeah, I mean, we're open to suggestions if, if the commission would like to further delibery. Can we but just go with implement? We've already got them. 
you know, it, this, is a, this was a question about making them stronger, okay. right? So I did the, the Yeah, I, I don't know. I know I'm obsessing over language here, but it's, you know, these, these are, this is a legal document. It's instructive. Um, you know, I don't know if we want to start from a baseline uh, assumption of where protections might be or if we just want to declare, implement protections. And that's, you know, kind of my preferred angle is to not have any underlying assumption walking into this and that the reader doesn't have an underlying assumption about what already exists in city code. Uh, you know, this is, you know, this is a guide to what our policies are and it, it can be declarative without relying on underlying assumptions about what was previously in place. And so that's... Well, what about just provide, provide protections, you know? So we were... Yeah, I mean, pro provide is, is synonymous enough with implement. Yeah. One question, and this is outside of what you're probably asking about, but there are, uh, I believe there are existing native tree species that uh, may not be climate adaptive, and I think that there are some climate adaptive that may not be considered native. And I just wanna make sure that we're allowing for and or. I mean, there may be times when you're actually trying to bring in new species mm -hmm. that are better suited for the new environment. And so that's, I'm just reading. There's been a lot of discussion to that effect. Okay. And that is kind of, I believe that that is understood. It's certainly okay. understood from my perspective that we are considering allowing non-native species that are climate adaptive. Resilient. Okay. Yeah, and I read that as the same as just that I, I had no confusion. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to not bring my con contextual understanding, you know, um, into the deliberations. Yeah. I, you know, I want this, you know, I need to get my context from the document, but I do have the contextual understanding that we fully intended for that to be the case, you know, that that has been, um, you know, what I've heard has been recommended from a lot of different sources, including the climate action plan, as far as I know. Okay. Um, if there's anything changed in there, I'll let you know, but it would only be to make sure that that was clear. Yeah. Uh, so I am going to speak to our climate specialist just to make sure that she and I are in agreement about how that language exists for that to reach that goal. I'm great with it if this works for her. Uh, I just want to confirm it. Thank you. So did we settle on the verb? Are we going with implement or provide? How about uh, per, through the development code, protect existing native species and climate adaptive. Awesome. Okay. I love that. All right. Okay. Got that, city? Yep. Okay. I think so. I'm uh, 3.2.6 has uh, the terminology climate change in it, which I'm noticing is in the dictionary or glossary, but it's very brief. And as a community that just took a very strong stance on com commu uh, climate action, I would strongly urge us to verify and confirm that's our intent or our understanding of climate change. In the glossary or in the policy? In the glossary. Okay. Because I think we continue to point back to it throughout the document itself. Okay. Continuing in section three. Uh, I have one for policy 3.5.5. Uh, which reads, examine development code changes that help reduce impacts on wildlife. And we use an example such as bird-friendly building design. I would also like to give an example uh, and add and wildlife corridors. Thank you. All right, that's a good one. So it would read, examine development code changes that help reduce impacts on wildlife such as bird-friendly building design and wildlife corridors. We mentioned that throughout this document, and I thought that that would be a good place to. Is that good? Lauren, what was your change again? Review climate change in the glossary. Oh, okay. Make sure it's consistent. City goals. Any more for section three? Yeah. Um, the 
proposed 3.3.8 from the Watersheds Council that related to um, fill existing gaps in knowledge of the population trends and connectivity of habitat, fish, and wildlife populations. Um, Which number again? It was, it's on the matrix because it wasn't actually added. Um, <clears throat> So the staff referenced um, 3.1.2, which is promote public education um, and encourage collaboration with community partners and organizations when developing strategies to protect air and water quality and other natural resources. Um, I, I think that the, um, sorry about that, the, I think the intention of this is to try to um, not necessarily inform the public, but document for the city's purposes, you know, like having, just having the information um, as opposed to, you know, educating with the information. And so I'm just wondering if... Oh, I, I thought this meant research. That's... Well, that you actually do the research of the so populations, I, the trends, I, I and the I think in the terms of, in the terms of, I mean, I don't know that we're, I don't think that the intent of this policy is that the city goes out and does research. I think that it's that we use the development review process to assemble additional data into, um, you know, and, and, and catalog that data so that we use that to fill existing gaps in knowledge of blah, blah, blah. I think that's what the intent of, I mean, that's how it reads to me when in a land use document is, you know, it's, and it's the same thing that we do with um, the Dogami um, Bulletin 99 data. You know, it's like we, we do soil sample studies and then, you know, we update our record, our database, you know, in the FEMA, you know, um, floodplains, you know, we update our data when we get new information um, from, you know, a site, um, site surveys or, you know, what, whatever that might occur through a development review. Um, and so in the event that's capturing some yep. of this data as part of a development review, then... Uh, right, but but I think that uh, in isn't it in this area uh, uh, where we say, hey, you know what, uh, uh, we should uh, use technology and on-field... Um, in-field verification. In-field verification, right? Isn't that in this section of the policy? 3.1.4 is the policy that tells us to periodically update. Doesn't, isn't that the same, sort of the same thing as uh, what? I, I, I think so, but uh, what, uh, I know, so I think what you can do is, is um, that's about the land, and I think this is about the. This is about the population of the, the of fish the, and the wildlife, right? And how they move through the city. So it's part of that. It might just be part of that habitat connectivity analysis. Well, uh, can't we just say fish and wildlife habitat and uh, uh, comma population uh, and corridors? Where? <laughs> in policy 3.14. Periodically update the city's inventory of wetlands, floodplains, fish and wildlife habitat, comma, population, comma, and corridors and other natural resources through both technology and infield verification. But I think that's the only thing that's missing. We cover it, but we just don't talk about the population. I don't think we're gonna be out counting fish. Well, I mean, that's right, and that's why I thought that, you know, if, if the data is captured through some other mechanism, that's where, you know, and then it comes into the city's possession through the form of, you know, documentation and a development review, then cataloging that data somehow and making it accessible or part of the body of knowledge. That, that would be part of what goes into defining the habitat that we're protecting under okay. 3.14. Okay. I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to talk that through um, and make sure that we're, we are, in fact, you know, covering this space in, in another if, section. Yeah, if we were hiring a, um, a biologist to do some work, they might go out and look at the, the streams and, and take those types of inventories, yeah. but that's, then that's just going to justify what stretch of stream you're protecting and what level. Right. Yeah. I, I, so I think it's, I mean, that's sort of embedded into the inventory, the inventory task. 
I have a question for goal 3.4, develop a healthy urban forest in Milwaukee. I'm recalling that we had a public comment um, at one point where a gentleman was in, uh, interested in, in holding accountable or um, discussing maintaining trees that were um, planted as part of a development project and how oftentimes um, they're planted and, and quickly they die off and there's, uh, whether it's established irrigation or a care for, uh, oftentimes the, they'll die off and then there's there's no recourse for replanting or um, um, maintaining the initially required uh, canopy. I, it seems like, it, I'm not sure if there's a, a way to incorporate that idea into this, but um, that has value, the input has value. So, I mean, you would be looking for policy language about monitoring, monitoring and maintaining required, I mean, trees that are planted as essentially like parts of, required through development proposals or something along those lines. Yeah. Do you see a natural place for that within any it, of the policies that you've seen or? Well, isn't that 3.4.2? Isn't that kind of what that's getting at? Well, it, it's it, not it very is, clear to me it, if that is. It, it, it's, I think it's sort of embedded into the idea of having a development code that is part of the effort to achieve the 40% tree canopy. It, I mean, it, it, it doesn't say it, but our development code is what we would use to make sure that we are enforcing the conditions that are put on a development to plant trees. And let me say that what we are going to be doing over the next nine months is looking at how effective our existing tree protection is and doing an audit of our code related to tree health and tree, you know, urban forestry. It's not just an audit about housing development, it's an audit about you know, how well trees can survive. Um, we can just make sure we do that. Okay, so you feel like it's covered? I do. Coming. It's coming. Is there, it's, I'm assuming there's a running list of what each one of these policies might begin to look like in code? Uh, or no, there something isn't, where we're recording these ideas that we, you know, believe are, in, are intended through the language, but not explicitly called out. We're starting that right this minute. Okay. I also <laughs> believe right. that that gentleman we ended up inviting to be on the tree board, I believe he was added to the tree board with the understanding that he was bringing this concept. I, I spoke to him that night. Oh, good. He presented to all of you. Yes. Uh, and the other piece of what he talked about was actually bonding for those trees so that there's yes. also financial right. culpability if the trees don't make it. So, yes, that is a part of that large package that we're taking out. You're going to see the small package, which is just for the public trees. They won't see it. But you'll hear about it uh, in a couple months. But that other piece is that 18 month window when we're working on these three things together. Thank you. And I'll send it to the plan, uh, public works director right now just to make sure. Did, Thank did you. we resolve uh, the 3.3.8 the issue? Yeah, it's covered in other policies. Okay. Um, the only other thing that I have for this section is um, 3.4.6, uh, referring back to the matrix. Um, the Watersheds Council had comments on December 9th to add the words and water quantity between stormwater and impacts in that first sentence. Um, so it's evaluate the stormwater and water quantity impacts associated with tree removal as part of the development review process. And um, staff was not opposed to those um, and acknowledge that they would be consistent with the other recommended additions to policies. So I, I think that we should include that there. And water, you just want to add in and water quality, right? Quantity. Oh, it does say quantity, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's this last batch of changes from the Watersheds Council, uh, you know, is, is trying to capture the, the recent science um, describing um, water quantity impacts of, uh, you know, climate change and... Uh, Does that mean more or less, or both? Both. Okay, I get it. Yeah, I mean, it's low flows in the summer, but then uh, really flashy, um, you know, high flow events. Right. Um, 
less trees around or if trees are dying, then if the rain does come, then what do you, it, there's less vegetation to... What do you think stormwater impacts means? If it doesn't mean... So I think it, I think the water quantity it would um, capture groundwater as well as stormwater. Okay. And so there's there's more water than just that which falls during the rain events. Right. And so adding that word would, would right. include that there as well, or right. include consideration of water in the ground. Like I've always wondered, I mean, I know why we do it, but why we all have to pipe our gutter water down uh, into a sewer and back out in the river and make it all dirty when it used to flow in the ground uh, onto the grass and make your lawn green. I know there's a whole bunch of reasons for it, but you know, sometimes the old ways are kind of the better ways. Any other comments for section three? Uh, I'm just, I'm reviewing section 3.5 closer and I I just don't, I, I'm not sure or comfortable that um, the energy efficiency go, goals go far enough, particularly given our concentration now. Um, and I, I just wonder if these need to be more descriptive of zero energy, net zero, or um, positive, net positive goals or reflections, if there needs to be anything more specific about our timeline. They're very broad. They are broad. I think right now, and this is a guess, I haven't talked to that team, uh, there's some fear about the building code having so much control over the energy efficiency components of the construction of the buildings, but uh, just because the energy code is set by the state. So we are working on that as a policy matter where the council is actually lobbying right now the governor to try and get more control of, over that, but we don't have a ton. So we've been doing it more through incentives. What I hear you saying is that we need to make sure the terminology we're using is consistent with the cap and that we need to make sure that um, we're doing everything we can to achieve that that's allowed. So if you're okay, what I'd like to do is talk to Natalie, just double check with her based on your question and then bring it back at the next meeting. Okay. And, and one of the concerns I would have is, is that you just read off three terms that are just only four or five years old as well. And so um, there will be new terms in the next five years as well. And what I don't want to do is I don't want to uh, be so specific that you uh, then end up eliminating being able to use whatever the next new term is. Well, my, we have a timeline now, 2045 is what I heard. And so we have three timelines, but yes. When some setting a timeline, there needs one. to be thresholds yeah. of some kind or something that indicates how you're, you're getting there. And these seem so, so broad that maybe there's more definition that's necessary if we're gonna. Well, the second piece of this is that you're reflecting other plans. So the, the part of the emergency that was declared by council includes that every three years, the climate action plan is going to be updated. So actually the new vernacular will be included into that document over time. So it may be just trying to better reference that document in here to make sure that it's continually tying back to that. Well, you so know, that so that's helpful. not a bad idea. Does that help uh, refer yep. to climate okay. action plan somewhere in the? Uh, um, yeah, but th this section's, uh, where do we, where yeah, do we would note that section, section six is yeah. where we do the majority of the discussion of energy uh, in the climate change and energy section, which is section six. So I think if we're going to start referring to the, to the cap, it's probably more appropriate within that section. So there's there's cross references in here. We talk about um, you know urban tree canopy in here. We also talk about it within section six as far as the intersection between how that impacts and helps to mitigate for climate change. Um, so there's policies that show up in multiple sections. Um, and so if you, you know, as part of your review and deliberation, if you think that there are ones that maybe are more appropriate for other sections that don't need to, du to be duplicated within multiple sections, uh, we can call that out and consider that. Um, but if you have additional language specifically related to energy conservation and, um, you know, net zero and references to the cap, I think section six is probably the, the more appropriate section. Because the other thing we're trying to do is not have the policies reference each other, right? Correct. And so, I mean, yeah, it's 
So the general direction we've received from the CPAC and from Planning Commission um, Council has been there's general acceptance of some level of redundancy um, that you know strengthens the document and calls attention to these things as important. But as with everything, there's you know excesses. And I just want to make sure that we. The staff explains their comment uh, as Mr. Kraska has submitted his suggestion for 3.6.7. Um, because I, I think what he's trying to get back to is, is to uh, 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 trying to get charging people for demolition uh, to encourage them to keep the building there. Right, G given an economic disadvantage to tearing down a building, I think is kind of what he's trying to get to. And um, so, if staff could elaborate on their uh, uh, their fee schedules. Yeah, so if we didn't understand that and didn't quite get the grasp of that, I mean, that's something that we discussed. I, I wasn't thinking of it within that as far as creating an economic disincentive. I mean, there are jurisdictions that make it $10,000 to knock down a house. Um, and they basically are doing that because they don't want to see houses demolished. This is um, the environmental section of the code. Mm -hmm. That's really more, this policy is more about, you know, the impact, air quality. Uh, about the air quality and that. Impacts, yeah. Okay. Um, if there was an interest in uh, creating a disincentive for, um, demolitions um, for which reason is one question if it was about maintaining historic buildings it would go into um, the previous section, section. Two. yeah well I, if it I was about affordable housing it would go into right I, I, and I think I think it's more about the idea of the affordable housing or keeping what inventory of middle income housing we already have because right. a 1500 square foot ranch is still middle housing. I mean, it could be the um, sustainability impacts uh, associated with, um, you know, material sourcing and, you know, I mean, there's... Um, I mean, it could be, but, but I think that, I think this is supposed to create a disincentive to tear down a house, which... For energy conservation or affordability purposes? Well, I mean, it's, I guess it's both. I mean, it's... So, but not here, not in this section. Is That's what staff is recommending. I, I think that's fine. I mean, yeah. it, is, but can you write that down on your little list so that we can remember to circle back to it? Your little list. <laughs> it's gonna be very we'll call it. We'll call it Lauren's list from here on out. <laughs> just, just as long as it's being recorded. I hope it's gonna be Mary's list, actually. <laughs> Notice how she uh, ran out of the room. <laughs> That's why you can blame her for it. <laughs> She'll watch the video tomorrow to make sure that she captures all that. <laughs> you can ask Denny and I in September. Her memory is a lot better than mine. Anything else for section three? No. Okay, let's move to section four. And so the first one out of the out of the gate here is just for consistency. Put section four colon in front of Willamette Greenway. This is one of the sections that um, relied a lot on the existing policies. That was one of the sections. Oh, that I, okay. Well, that explains a lot. There are some things that are different, but I mean, it. Did. Well, yeah. It has a completely different feel. The structure and the every everything just feels completely different as well, we read, read through this section. Yeah, it, it actually explains why there's this comment in here and it never gets repeated. I, I, I tried to bring this up at the last one, where you guys. Uh, say, hey, look, uh, the mass, we are no longer going to do master plans. We're going to do community use service. But then you never ever say community use service again in this section. You only refer to the park master plans. Uh, and you don't mention Peter Kerr Park, which is on Elk Rock Island. And, and uh, I don't know if Elk Rock Island plan incorporates Peter Kerr Park. They are two separate entities. I believe the Elk Rock Island Management Plan incorporates okay. Peter Kerr Park. 
the same piece of property. Uh, I understand that. Okay. I just want to make sure that that, that is what was uh, in the uh, in the contractual agreement between the city and uh, Portland that that is how that reads. I can look it up while we're sitting here. Um, because it is Peter Kerr Park. Yeah, I mean, one this section does have, the, the formatting is totally different than, I'm, I'm actually surprised we didn't catch that earlier, but our, our um, Many of these sentences don't start with a verb, and pretty much everywhere else in here, they start with a verb. Yeah, and you have A's and B's and C's and all sorts of things. If I remember right, this was the chapter that you worked on, Denny. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it was. It was. And I... Um, I think that's my wife calling. <laughs> but I, I uh, haven't looked at it for a while either. Um, Can we hold off reviewing this? Uh, it seems like there's work to be done. Is is there work to be done? Well, if we wanted to change the formatting, there's some work that needs to be done. Well, I, I, I'm... At, thing looks like a copy-paste. Yeah, I'm fine with it, except, you know, and so I'll, I'll show it out. Uh, and so in policy 4.32B in the second paragraph... Uh, it should read, I think, the review process will require consistency with the following plans. Willamette Greenway chapter of the comprehensive plan, uh, adopted parks master plans, uh, uh, and community service use process, the Greenway design plan, and the downtown riverfront land use no, I shouldn't. Uh, I don't. No, because you say that uh, Elk, Milwaukee Bay and Elk Rock Island, Kronberg and Spring Park are already master plans. But it says all future master plans or amendments to plans will be adopted to the community service use process. Okay. Which is not creating a new master plan, which we currently have to do. Right? You have to change a master plan. What? The way this is hopefully going to work in the future is the um, you wouldn't adopt a master plan as an element of the comprehensive plan. We have a number of these master plans that have already been adopted so we will we will treat future master plans just they get adopted through the community uh, service. I, under, I understand that 100%. Okay. I get that 100 but what happens is is that in the rest of every time that you talk about a park master plan, right? You have to actually include uh, you have to have the statement that says adopted park master plan because that is the thing that won't change, right? But then it can change in the future through a community service use process. So in other words, you can't say use park master plans to outline the major recreational uses because you can still use a community surf uh, in the future, a community service use process to change those recreational things. But it's still, you're modifying the park master plan through that process. So it's still a park master plan. It's just going through that type of a review instead of instead of a comprehensive plan review. Uh, right. It's a CSU review. So it's a different land use procedure. Well, then you should put, uh, how about uh, use adopted park master plans or reviews to outline. Beca because what you're basically saying is, is because you say in the beginning that the way that the parks are adopted, they are the way that they are going to be and they cannot change. That you're not going to change the master plan. Those are set. No, they could be amended. Through a community use process. Yeah. But what happens is, is that when you read this, it says, well, use your park master plan, which you're going to have that park master plan that's going to sit there. Which can be updated through a CSU review. And you still, at the end of that CSU review, you still have a parks master plan. Uh, all right. And it's been amended through that procedure that you just did. Well, maybe, maybe we need an explanation in the glossary of what a community service use process looks like for a master plan. Because when I read it, and, I, and this is the fifth time that I've gone through it, it just, it seems like to me that 
it, there are two different, all future park master plans or amendments to plans will be adopted through the community service use process, which, uh, which makes it sounds like that the community service use process is something different than what your master plan is, I guess. I don't know, maybe I'm crazy. If the commission says shut up, Greg, and uh, we don't need to talk about it, then that's fine, but. I, I actually think that staff should rework this section because it's just entirely inconsistent with the other sections. Like for example, I mean looking at um, policy 3.3.3 .3 about setbacks, and then you go on as a descriptor, when not establish it through this process, you know, conditional use will establish setbacks. And it's just not consistent with how we, how we talk about other policies. We don't put in like caveats or right. further explanation. So I, I guess, I mean, I think that it needs to be reworked and, and removal of those, um, those extended explanations that, that to me kind of go more into code right. um, or a supplemental document. Okay. I think maybe you are right about that. And add in Peter Kerr Park into that too, please. Please, Peter Kerr Park. Actually, if you do nothing else, can you just do that so <laughs> Commissioner Hemner is satisfied? But is that what we call it? I think it is, isn't it? Yes. Yep. It's right here. How often yeah. do we use the verb undertake efforts to make? I will get it for you. I'll get you that. And could that perhaps be revised to be more legible? Which policy is 4. it? 4.6.2. Yep. I, I would suggest we move on to section five, um, unless there's any more no, point, I mean, point issues we want to bring up because we, we really want this, uh, we really want the staff to be able to, you know, uh, work on this and bring us what we're looking for next time. So if there's additional guidance you think they need, let's, let's try to get it. I think that's relevant guidance, but I'm also a stickler for language, so. And that, will it, keep, that will keep coming up tonight, I'm sorry. And as we move into section five, just as, as a reminder from the list of key issues from the staff report, the one that's called out for section five is policy 5.4.1. So just to be taking a look at that. Okay. So comments on section five now. I guess I'll just jump in really quick because I'm also, um, you know, as we're kind of referencing the matrix of comments, I also really appreciate the um, the comprehensive plan policies related to DEI, so attachment four. So I've been parallel kind of referencing that. And so um, I do, you know, just, calling it out uh, policy 5.2.5, increase outreach and education for hazard awareness and natural disaster preparedness. I mean, I think that that is, you know, it's just great that it's in there. So I, I just wanna, you know, kind of reiterate that like, you know, these things are within the document and really provide very specific um, direction as um, Commissioner Edge was saying, this is a directional document and so I, I think that I, you know, it's really concrete and and a very, you know, will have really lasting impacts to, to do that work. That's my. Is, is this the one that you wrote, Kim? I, I, no, I didn't write it. Um, but I think that, um, you know, it's a uh, 5.2.5. Sorry, um, it's under the partnerships and education section, and um, yeah, you know, I think that that's. That's an area that's, again, like really actionable, concrete. Mm -hmm. Okay. You wanted us to uh, focus on 5.4. Well, I was just one. noting it in referencing the staff report and just making sure that we're um, acknowledging the key issues that have been um, brought up in the last couple staff reports, just that 5.4.1 was one of them. I, and I can expand on this. Please do. I mean, there was quite a bit of discussion at CPAC, at Planning Commission, at Council about 
the concept of prohibiting development in the floodplain. And as we have just gone through the Elk Rock Island work, and we have, you know, and just the sort of the headaches associated with that, needless to say, but where, where we are on that, just to, for a recap, quick recap, is the developer is going to come back with a five lot subdivision proposal to the council that has five lots up on 19th. So they'll be pulling the majority of the development out of the floodplain and out of, again, what we were using there was the natural resource code, the habitat conservation area, avoid, minimize, mitigate language to um, encourage them to not develop in the floodplain. The FEMA required language to be eligible for flood insurance does not prohibit development in the floodplain. And what we talked about through our process was, no, we need language that prohibits development in the floodplain. And where we have suddenly balked a bit is if we prohibit flood development in the floodplain, we are potentially facing a takings challenge um, where uh, prohibiting that development could result in someone saying, you've just taken my all of my development right away. Um, I have, have a work session scheduled for February 4th with the council about this topic. And we've got a, and part of that reason is because the engineering staff had gotten a, a grant to Evaluate, well, they, it was actually DLCD, the state got the grant to update um, floodplain ordinances across the state. They contacted us, asked us if we wanted them to look at, do an audit of our code. Engineering staff said yes. We worked with them to, to come up with an updated version of the code. That's ready to go to hearing now. They've got a draft that's kind of hearing ready. It will come to you and then go to the, the council. The problem with that version is it's inconsistent with this draft policy as written before the edit that I just made or proposed. Um, you know, it either we need to change the policy like like it's proposed here, or we need to modify this code that's going to be coming before you and the council to somehow prohibit development, or. The other part of this, there's two other options that we're going to talk to council about. One is um, allow development in the floodplain, but increase the requirements to bring development up so that we may be forcing water onto other properties, but at least the stuff that gets built is going to be well out of the the potential for flood damage, or at least it's going to be one heck of a flood if it if it gets to them, maybe two two feet or more above uh, where finished floors would need to be two feet or more above the flood level. Um, and the other option would be um, to go ahead and change this, but strengthen our environmental provisions um, to do more to protect the uh, the floodplain. So using those using the HCA again the habitat conservation area designations to 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 be the mechanism that manages floodplain protection or or water quality uh, related code provisions to do to get at that. Those are going to require some work, some thought, some some efforts. Haven't talked with Justin much about this. We've been, um, but there's there's multiple multiple ways to approach it, and we wanted to have that discussion with council to see how much flexibility they had. So this and this or. I'm just, I, if, if, if we keep it as an and, we're going to have to figure out a way to do 
either a, a transfer of development rights or some taking does this have to do with, uh, I'm going to say this wrong, Proposition 49 or whatever this code yeah. 49 is, and that basically states that you can't change code on people's land that already own it or start to develop, what, what, what is it? Well, if you, you can't take away a development right without compensating for it. So okay. if we right. are, if we, now that all these properties basically have this right to develop. Yeah, but how many? How many properties are we really talking about? Well, you know, there aren't that many residential properties, but there are a heck of a lot of industrial properties. Oh. And um, we're, we're, I think we're less worried about the residential properties in that sense. I see. We, oh, right. Everything along Johnson Creek and all that uh, kind of stuff. Mm. I thought Measure 49 was constrained to housing. It may be, but it's probably not. It could very well be, I don't re recall, but it, it um, we would still have, I think, a similar mm -hmm. claim issue that one could raise if you're, you know, that's a really interesting question, Joseph. I will research that. And could we, I, I personally would like to prohibit at least residential housing in any floodplain, because, I mean, it just seems ridiculous, but... I understand that there's rules that protect the, you know, the developer or protect the land owner. Well, I mean, we're, we're kind of um, stuck with the legislation right now that it says that any housing currently, com or any property currently committed to a uh, residential use is needed housing. And so, um, you know, we, we're, we're really constrained for things that already have a house on a lot. So it has to be or? Um, no. It could be and, but we would just need to be um, part of the CPIC's job or whatever came out of that would be to help define the universe of, of community benefits that, you know, might. Um, well, but according to any legislation, a house is a community benefit. I think that we have the flexibility in defining that. I mean, it's again, it's restrict development, not prohibit. It's restrict development to uses that have a demonstrated community benefit, and for which the natural hazard and environmental impacts can be adequately mitigated. So you you have your regular mitigation requirements and, and hazard risk requirements and standards, and then there would be some other component that would be required um, that would have a demonstrated community benefit. It could be floodplain storage. It could be a, a well. Actually, a you could trail. say uh, it provides a bunch of jobs. So that way you can have your industrial district uh, be in a floodplain if you put in and I mean I think that it's up to the city to define what a demonstrated community benefit is and um, y you know that I think that the the universe of community benefits that can be demonstrated as part of a development or is broad enough that we could include the word and here um, even if it was single family housing, you could have a trail or some, you know, I mean, an, an easement that protects habitat in perpetuity or, I mean, there's all kinds of different things you could do. And so, um, you know, to qualify a community benefit, um, it doesn't have to be, you know, something oh, big. Right, but you don't want to have to have that uh, a walking path mitigate any sort of environmental impact. I'm just, I'm just saying there, you know, you could have, uh, you know, it could be a trail connection across somebody's property, you know, between two pieces of trail that, you know, are disconnected right now. I mean, there's just different things you can do. And I don't want to put constraints on, you know, and, and theorize about all of the different things right now. But um, there are, there are options that someone could do to provide a community benefit that are, um, you know, compatible with different kinds of uses, including resi you know, low density residential uses. Are you an and or or person? I'm an and person on this one. Because I think that demonstrated community benefit is a very broad, I, I think it's very broad. And I think that you could easily get um, uh, things defined there that, um, that would meet that, that criteria that would not be <coughs> takings or in excess of uh, proportionality or anything like anything that we'd have to worry about. So we, we, for the floodplain code, 
we need to put that trigger in and it's definitely not clear and objective. I mean, there's there are some things we'd need to really think about in terms of how we would address that. I think that's fair on the surface. I think you could get to a, a clear and objective list. Uh -huh. um, but again, yeah, I don't know. Right now is the time to be brainstorming everything yeah. possible. Yeah. But I, I think you can get to clear, I think you could define clear and objective standards around that. You can pick the thing off the list that you're gonna do um, to, to meet the community benefit. You could have a menu and that menu would be clear and objective. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not. Well, I don't know that you guys need to, I mean, I'm, you don't have to solve this one tonight because we've got a, a council discussion coming up as well that it's going to influence this. But if you all felt very strongly about about it one way or another, I would be happy to relay that to the council. Um, uh, yeah, is the, I mean, is the difference between um, say like a small subdivision going in that you know with houses in the floodplain and they have mitigation you know for the individual dwellings and the occupants of the dwellings, but then there's it's not contributing anything else to the the common good versus one that does the exact same thing but then provides a walking trail or provides additional flood storage capacity or you know, just does something extra that's a community benefit. Um, and so I don't think that that's a huge ask. Mm -hmm. I, I feel strongly that the natural hazard risk and environmental impacts must be adequately mitigated and, and gets us there. So I think we'll sort out the rest later as Denny's invited us to, to do. I didn't, and, act, I didn't actually hear what you said. You wanted the and. and. He's an and it's got to be and because you can't, it, it would be crazy to not say that we have to mitigate the natural hazard risk. Um, that, that's crazy and or allows that. And, um, I, this this may sound silly, but I mean, I, I you know, uh, could we have a show of hands for and? I, I'm, I'm kind of in the and column too. Okay. I will relay but that. But that's just, to you the, know, that's obviously for your discussion with yeah. the council. I think we can move on. Okay. Um, uh, for the, um, again, referring back to the matrix for a policy that didn't actually get um, in, uh, into the draft, the 547 proposed by the Watersheds Council. Um, I think this, the spirit of this was to um, just really allow the, um, allow different um, interest groups or, uh, you know, whatever to, um, to kind of sign on to um, get pre-application conference uh, comment requests. You know, some, some way of being able to be engaged early in the process and you know it doesn't look like I don't think that we're trying I don't think what they're trying to do I shouldn't say we I know I'm affiliated with them but I haven't worked on this with them um, the uh, I don't think the intent here is to go through expensive um, you know, r reviews of all of these different, um, you know, green infrastructure and development processes. I, I think the, the uh, I think it's just the interest groups looking for an opportunity to, you know, engage early enough in the process that it can affect the trajectory of the project. And that's really at the pre-application conference stage, being able to submit some comments or being able to, you know, know that something's coming down the road so that, you know, you can, um, and so whether it's the Watersheds Council or it's the Audubon Society or some other special interest group, someone wants to sign on to, you know, get early notice of, of um, development proposals, even if they're not into the development review track yet, you know, and they're just in the pre-application conference track, just being able to engage in that process early enough to, um, uh, you know, possibly affect that trajectory with, um, you know, their, uh, that whatever special interest groups expert knowledge in a certain area that may be relevant to a given site or context. Does that make sense? Is that? So are you calling for at least some version of? Well, I'm just trying to make sure that we're on the same, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't think that what they were asking for was quite as heavy as had the staff comments, you know, kind of read. Well, it, I mean, there's a number of ways you could interpret their draft 547, I suppose. Um, ideally, you know, you'd have, someone on staff that is skilled in this area and you could have them help somebody with their 
project in advance of a submittal. But um, just so the or term a, cutting edge seems a little nuanced, like uh, uh, over over bearing. Joseph, are you saying that I'm cut, cutting edge? I don't need cutting edge in there. I'm, I'm just I'm just looking at the spirit of the policy, you know, uh, and trying to get to the the, yeah. the root meaning of, of the proposed policy. To me, it just felt like you know it's a it's a mechanism to get the information sharing to occur, mm -hmm. not necessarily. Uh, how about have someone on on staff? I, I get it. I get. It. How about this? Create a mechanism that ensures proposed development consults on green infrastructure and development processes early in the development process. So that means that it, you don't necessarily have to consult with a city staff person, but you should consult with somebody on uh, green infrastructure and development processes. Uh, and then that way it could be suggested by city staff that say, hey, you know what, we're really a green city and stuff like that, you should maybe go find a consultant. Hmm. Well, I think in most cases they're going to have a consultant. It's a question of whether that consultant obviously agrees with or addresses some of the concerns of our watershed council, the watershed councils in the area or the Audubon Society. Um, and so I think there is potentially a place for this. I guess the, we would need to be careful with the language as far as how mandatory we're making this. What if in a pre, what if an applicant at the pre-application meeting says, no, I don't, I don't want to meet with the Watershed Council. I already know what they're going to say and sure. I'd rather not do that. Are we going to require require them or? Well, but no, you just say consult so they can consult you know, with whomever, we could be, the city could provide a list of people to consult with if they wanted to, to choose to. Doesn't make it a requirement. Or someone that has a, some certification or whatever. Right. Yeah, so if that's the case and if we want to focus that consultation on natural resources, then I think, you know, this section or natural hazards, this section would be the most appropriate. If we wanted just general early consultation on pre-application meetings, it would be probably more appropriate for section one if okay, that's yeah, for I, the community at large. Um, I, and I would have to look back through. I can't remember if we have that language or not. Yeah, I, I, I like what Commissioner Hamer is suggesting. Um, I, I think that that more encapsulates what is being proposed by this than what I was originally thinking. Well, right. I guess the idea is is that let's not put something in here that's going to be a burden on the city that we that will probably never ever implement. Uh, but the idea is is that hey, you know what? What we want to do is we want to say to developers. Uh, you know, we really, we are, you know, we're really into keeping our floodplains nice and we're really into green infrastructure, we're really into development processes. And so, you know, you might want to consult with somebody and, you know, come up with some really good ideas that you're going to bring forward to us. Yeah, I mean, mechanism. And here's a list, and here's, right, and here's a list of people that, you know, that we know that you could go talk to for free. Well, I think you could just get create a mechanism. Just could you just remove that and say ensure proposed development receive consultation on green infrastructure and development processes early in the development process. Well, there's enough ambiguity to uh, for how this is, um, how we would def you know, it's require It's consistent that. with the level of yeah. ambiguity in all other states exactly. being made. So, exactly. and I think it should live in this section five. You think it should win the natural hazards? Yep. Yeah. Yes. If it gets removed, it'll be forgotten. Well, but we have Lauren's list going. Uh, but what I'm thinking is, is that don't we have a... Uh, Lauren's list. Uh, shouldn't that be, don't we talk, because green infrastructure doesn't really necessarily mean hazard, natural hazards. This In the context of flood control, it could, uh, you know, and, and other kinds of... Um, and you know, it should say the word natural hazards. Or whatever. Well, why don't we uh, consult on natural hazards and development processes? There you go. That way it fits right into this section. I mean, it's, I think the idea is, you know, making sure that we keep green infrastructure in there, but green infrastructure in there, but um, intent, but uh, specifically apply it since it's in the section of natural hazards, I think, is, you know, would be, would be fine. Okay, so we agree and we can move forward? I think so. Okay. Can I Denny's going to ask what we just agreed no, I, on. <laughs> I, think I, I think I got it. I'm just try, I'm trying to think about how to 
make this real. And it could be a step in the pre-app conference, or, or the, not the pre-app conference as much as um, an applicant would need to demonstrate that they have done some review something they've gone somewhere and and checked with the watershed council or something it's sort of like the the required neighborhood meeting that we've got it's the you know you've met with the green advocate somewhere you know whoever the list of appropriate green advocates are could you ask the watershed council to weigh in yeah Almost like, you know, well, similar to what like the fire marshal would do or any other bureau. We usually wouldn't do that at a pre-application stage. But you could handle, oh. but they could hand them a list of, uh, you know, Northwest Watershed Council, Johnson Creek Watershed Council. I mean, you could, yeah, you could just say, hey, here's some contact people if you want to go talk to them. Eh. Well, I wasn't thinking if if you if you want to submit your application, you're going to have to show that you check this box. Well, I think the no, no. part of the difficulty is that the Clackamas Fire District has regulatory authority over the fire code, right. whereas these watershed councils don't have regulatory authority. I mean, um, so it would just be important the way that it's phrased. We want, I think what, I, what I'm hearing is we want to make sure that that resource is not only available, but is, you know, hopefully utilized by applicants, you know, and I have spoken with, with Neil um, Schulman at, at North Clackamas, and he's yeah offered and he's excited about the opportunity to re review projects a little bit earlier because I think they get frustrated when it gets to the actual land use application and comes to planning commission and they feel like the project is, if not fully baked, you know, you know. But it's the same complaints that our citizens, yeah. or that our residents <coughs> and the NDAs have. Correct, and that's why you know we've created the pre-application portal, um, and so in most cases, everything that's required of you know anything that is a major natural resources application, so um, you know type two or type three natural resource review is going to be required to have a pre-application, and so. Um, you know, can we cover it through that pre-application mechanism or should it be something outside of that, you know, something where a pre-app is automatically routed to people that sign up to be on that, you know, essentially like a new email listserv, which is not super hard to create for the city. We have all sorts of email subscription lists. Do we create a pre-app email subscription list so they get notice of every pre-app that comes in and they can, um, but then are we mandating that they be consulted or are we encouraging that they be consulted? Do we need to figure this out right now or can we can, I mean, I do we, we have I the spirit of the, what's being brought up here? Well, I think it depends on how you word it, you know? If it's, if this would, I think both things are relevant. I mean, you know, you the the, the volunteers that, that you know have this, uh, you know, in, you know, in their sphere of you, you know uh, concern are are going to be excited to participate early in the process and be excited to be engaged early in the process and have the opportunity to submit you know feedback um, to a pre-app conference. But um, but also the idea of ensuring means that you know you're saying um, you know show us some proof that you went out and consulted the NDA or the the watershed council or the Audubon or you know whatever you know it, it happens to be um, you know you're you're asking for you know and then it could be you know if you come to the city we'll give you a list of, of you know, resources that you can contact or you can go get your own as long as they're certified in whatever green technology whatever then you know you've got you know, you just show us and, you know, it just has to be included in the packet like, uh, you know, a lot of other things that, you know, you went to the proper resource and got this, their stamp of approval and... So is your suggestion ensure proposed development receives cutting edge consultation? I think we can not, drop not cutting, cutting edge. edge. Or is it something else? Oh. Ensure proposed development receives consultation on green infrastructure and development early in... Uh, early in the development process as it relates to natural hazards. Yes. There's a couple processes in there that don't. Oh, 
why don't we just say insurers proposed development consults on green infrastructure and development and not receive, just say consults. That way it gives a lot of lot away on how uh, you can consult. It doesn't tie anybody's hands down. I don't know what that means exactly. I don't, yeah. Just. It's like, are they consulting someone else? Are they receiving, I mean, this, this, I understand this. All right. Can I add one more piece of complexity? No. I get really nervous when we come up with a list of who is an acceptable at, uh, person in a given category versus another. So uh, the city can't endorse a company. We can't endorse, a, right? So it gets really complicated. So as much as possible, whatever the language is, I'd really encourage it to be they can figure out who qualifies and they bring it in. But I don't want to get in the business of the city creating a list. That's why you don't want to say receive. That's why you just want to say consult. Or something, but I'm concerned about, yeah, receipts. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't want us channeling to, you know, but to the idea of having, you know, oh, here's a list of resources which you can, you know, maybe the city has available. You know, here's a first list that you can, you know, look at at the most. But, um, but yeah, the idea is that ultimately you would just produce some documentation that you consulted with somebody who knows what they're talking about on this in well, this subject area. You know, I understand the city's concern about, you know, having a, you know, a. Uh, you know, a preferred list that, you know, has all sorts of, uh, you know, legal issues. But at the same time, I think, you know, the, the, just the mere statement that consults with, well, consults with who? You know, the barista at Starbucks? I well, totally agree. Yeah. And so, I, I, you know, I kind of like something along the lines of a, a recognized authority, a subject matter expert, and leave it at that. Yeah. As long as everybody on this, this sort of discussion understands that it's probably going to be them defining yeah. who that is. Great. I don't. I don't want to move off of what we're of uh, the hazard things, but uh, I think that staff makes a really nice statement here, where it says that it has created an online portal and notification process to make pre-applications conferences available for public review. Uh, I think that should actually uh, go into uh, goal 1.3 and be made a new policy that basically says create an online portal and notification process. And then you don't have to add it on to Lauren's list because you've already actually started to do it. That would be maintain. But okay, no. create and maintain. There you go, check. No, it's, it's been created. All right, well, maintain. Yeah. <laughs> and put it into the uh, maintain transparency and accountability. <laughs> Isn't that where that goes? Or uh, or you could put it one. into 1.1. 1. 1. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, I, I think that is a really good statement, mm -hmm. and it should be in this plan. I, I, I think that I, I, that's a wonderful thing that you guys did. Thank I you. Think, I think you're right. Yeah. I have a comment, 5.3.2. Um, I'm wondering if we should include the word diversity, increase the quality, resiliency, diversity, and redundancy of utility and transportation infrastructure. Often now we're talking about diversifying those uh, infrastructures and utilities. You were too fast for me. Which one are you in? Just after resiliency, I would add which, the word diversity. I'm not even sure which policy you're in. 5.3.2. Quality, resiliency, diversity. and diversity. Yes. Diversity and... one more for this section as well, and I'm glad that Miss Ober came back, because... Um, Y'all have incredible focus. It's been three hours. I'm so... 5.4.5. So to technically cert, their name is Milwaukee Community Emergency Response Team, but 
they are controlled by the Clackamas Fire District. So it either needs to say support expansion of Clackamas Fire District Community Emergency Response Team, or it needs to say support expansion of Milwaukee Community Emergency Response Team. The city does not own. Yeah. yeah. And if I could note that we did receive a comment from, I believe, Linda Hedges, a CERT member who pointed that out, and so. And I noticed it didn't make the matrix either, so. Didn't make. You're it correct. Was, it was written somewhere, though. You had. No, 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 no. You guys got it. Just got overlooked. Yeah. The the language of Milwaukee cert is consistent with how Milwaukee talks about it on MilwaukeeOregon.gov, where it's referred to as Milwaukee's cert team. So right. I, that. But but it also exists on the Clackamas Fire. It, the Clackamas Fire District semi funds it or. Operate. They provide so, over yeah. the coverage for them for insurance and other Dropping purposes. the word cities does it, right? Yeah, but you got to put in, then you got to add just Milwaukee. The Milwaukee CERD. Because their official title in the city is Milwaukee Community Emergency Response Team. So Ms. Hedges had called it out in relation to its description um, within the background section for Section 5 as opposed to the policy. So we'll revise it in both places. To okay to clarify the role in the regulatory oversight of CERT. In 5.4.2, uh, stormwater is one word and at the end of that statement. Uh. And then uh, I'm just wondering, does the term green infrastructure need to be uh, in the glossary? Probably. Do we understand what green structures is it? It, it? I think it probably might mean something to somebody else. Okay, it is in the glossary. It, I'm sorry, it is? Good job, it is. Okay. Yeah, so it's nice. on page, the top of 5.1, page 187. Um. Disregard. I have no more comments. Anything section else for five. section five? Um, let's, uh, so it's 9.30. Um, how do we want to best utilize our remaining time and how long do we want that remaining time to be? D Chair, uh, uh, Mancy, I, I would actually like to ask staff uh, to comment on Mr. Orlento's idea of having, especially with the new added stuff from uh, Commissioner Edge, having the CPAC reconvene one more time and looking at section seven and eight. Oh, if you would like, if, uh, yeah. unless if you want to carry on through uh, the schedule, but I would like to have that discussion before we leave tonight. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'll wait for Denny to come back in. I would note that the CPAC has probably more so than any, either planning commission or council has taken a look at section seven and eight more than either of those. Um, so as far as it being a direction to reconvene the CPAC, I, th I think we obviously need to have clarify what we're trying to get out of that because um, Commissioner Travis obviously being involved with the CPAC can some pro provide some additional context but it's, um, the urban design policies were discussed a number of times at CPAC um, and so as far as the proposed addition of goal 8.4 and all of the implementing not implementing but all the underlying policies within the proposed goal 8.4 that is something that if you think the CPAC could provide direction we could reach out and gauge the availability um, we had been wanting to give them a chance to kind of discuss neighborhood hubs as well so that's something we could look at but Denny the question was um, or the suggestion from Commissioner Hemer was regarding the proposed reconvening of uh, CPAC to discuss section seven and eight. Um, Mr. Chris Ortolano's suggestion on that. Um, well, and, and the reason why I say section seven, because that's already been adopted, right? Yeah. By resolution, uh, is down, yeah. because of the vast changes that Commissioner Edge, and I haven't had a chance to read through all of them. They are non-substantive. They do not change the spirit of a thing. Okay, so. Clean up language and present consistently. Okay, so section eight then. Thank you. <laughs> 
They, they did discuss Section 8. Uh, uh, they, I just raised the question if staff have, thought it was a good idea I, or whatever. I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> We've gotten a lot of comments on Section 8. Okay. I don't um, know that... It, I, and they've commented on Section 8. So... I would note that, I mean, as far as Section 8, especially the proposed Goal 8.4, that's something that the CPAC was not fond of that type of language, the neighborhood integrity and the kind That's of right. inference that additional density was automatically going to be um, a negative for established neighborhoods, um, no matter the scale of that density, whether it's limited infill development of missing middle housing options or um, we heard some testimony tonight where people obviously agreed with that. Um, and so... Uh, um, I would say I would let Commissioner Travis respond as a CPAC member, but there was pretty much of the unanimous opinion, um, there was pretty much consensus at the CPAC that they didn't want to have that type of language. So if we're going to have that, I don't think it's going to be direction provided by the CPAC. I think it's going to need to be a planning commission and city council that provide their thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, it's well stated. I mean, we did discuss it at length over a couple of meetings and um, decided that that was not the direction that we wanted to put into the plan. Okay. I just so. wanted just wanted a response. Mm -hmm. uh, Chair, um, I would, in response to your question from a few minutes ago, I would recommend that we try to get through section six and then see where we are. Okay. So just uh, before we move on, because I think this, this whole issue of uh, the reconvening of the CPAC is, uh, uh, you know, warrants uh, you know a discussion and, and you know a, a a way forward is that the question I would ask is that it, it, does the CPEC offer an opportunity for additional community involvement in the matters that they were highlighted in tonight's public testimony? You know, the CPAC has, I mean, they could take additional, they could take testimony, but, you no, know. Can the no, the CPIC. Oh, the CPIC. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The CPIC is, I mean, that is what we're going to need to, we're going to need to design and involve the community on on a variety of issues there. You know, I mean, it would it could be open houses, it could be town halls, it could be um, other outreach mechanisms, small group discussions. We haven't figured that out yet, but yes. Okay, so outreach could be a, a primary component of a CPIC. It will absolutely be a It's a substantial component. portion of the work that's happening for the okay. next 18 months is to actually talk about how we transfer all of this into code. So that's literally what we're going to be talking about is what does HB 2001 actually mean within our code and how do we apply those into our code. Uh, we've gotten direction from council that's very clear that they want to see that conversation ebb and flow with the community, that that conversation Conversation they recognize will present information, but that that will change over time as we talk to the community and to the CPIC. So yes, I think that there will be a substantial amount of engagement around what the design, what it looks like. So the reason I bring that up is I'm, I'm glad to hear those responses is that, you know, we, uh, I, I, I just would not want to, you know, to leave this issue of, well, no, we already talked about it. No. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, the CPAC, all volunteers, spent a lot of time, effort, in trying to involve the community and coming up with their best recommendations. And uh, so I'd be concerned about going to the, back to the CPAC and say, well, you really didn't do your job right, okay? They, they, they did the, the best job that they, they possibly could, and I think it's a very good product that they brought to them. But at the same time, you know, some folks have uh, voiced some concerns, and I think that there's an avenue for those concerns to be aired without the disruption of, uh, of kind of, you know, going through some sort of reset. My, 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 my sense is that it's about the, the concern is a lot about how it's um, rolled out, how it's implemented. I don't, I don't know if um, it's uh, necessarily the, that these ideas are bad. 
and they want to reverse from them, but it's a this sensitive way in which they're rolled out and implemented. I don't know if others felt that way or if you felt like there was an all out kind of cry for uh, reversing any of the comprehensive plan. Uh, my feeling is, is that there are three uh, camps. Uh, there is the camp that doesn't mind uh, uh, Milwaukee um, uh, becoming more like a Selwood, a, a busier place with each street kind of having a place to go. I think there are other camps that say, hey, look, we don't really mind the density, but the problem is is that you just can't jam it all in at once. Um, you have to take care of the infrastructure first and then allow that density to follow. And then I think you have your third camp, which is saying, I've lived in this town for 50 years. It's always been this way. I don't want it to change. And so I think that you have these three different elements uh, that happen. Um, I think the CPAC uh, is more apt to be more willing to talk about uh, the density changes because of the reason what density brings, more affordable housing, all that kind of stuff. The middle of the road believe that, hey, you know what, we need to have these uh, middle of in, uh, these middle level houses and probably some more apartment buildings, but uh, you know there are some risks associated with it, and if we don't, we, we can't just stick them on a bunch of streets that have a bunch of potholes and expect everybody to be happy. And then there are people that are always going to say, look, don't change my life. I don't like change. And it's very difficult to deal with. So um, I think you heard from uh, at least two of those camps uh, in our public testimony. Um, and so it's... It, you need to have that conversation with the residents uh, and with future users of Milwaukee as well. Um, you know, what what do you want your city to, to feel like? And, it, and I know it sucks because you use the word feel. It's, it's almost like we need a vision and a process to set one. Well, you know. <laughs> I hear you, but but, <laughs> I, but I think it's a mistake though to say people want Selwood and to point to Selwood like as some kind of example of what we're trying to accomplish here. No, I, I, no, no I'm sorry. We're trying to solve problems. I, I'm and, sorry. And, I, I don't and, know and we how. We heard a lot of testimony I, tonight I about people saying uh, that we don't want to be Portland or don't, whatever. Don't don't take my. We're just don't, trying to solve problems that have been identified as existing in Milwaukee. Thank thank you for correcting me, Commissioner Joseph. Please don't, or Commissioner Edge. Please don't take uh, the way that I. I I use my example as a negative impact. I, I was um, negative or positive. I don't want. I mean, I don't. I don't think that we're looking at Portland as an example. I think that we're looking okay. at all of the available information, all of the available research, and we're saying, how do we solve our problems in this city? And that's what we're doing. And people, you know, may have some people may have the idea that we're trying to mimic Portland. We're not trying to mimic Portland. We're trying to solve problems and um, you know there's some lessons to be learned from Portland there's some lessons to be learned from Minneapolis there's some lessons to be learned from Grand Rapids that you know um, abolished single-family zoning ten years ago um, and they have you know and, and, and Grand Rapids Michigan is not burned down and it is not turned into a crime fest it, you know it, it, it has not substantially changed from where it is but there is more housing that's available that's affordable to more people that live there and so you know these are not these huge wholesale change transformative changes this is you know i mean we're we're setting policies that we're we're trying to solve these problems over a 20-year horizon it does have to be incremental and it will be incremental by its nature because we're relying on private in, i mean private investment to to fulfill these objectives for us i mean largely and so you know we have to enable that but um you know and and it's not going to be four-story apartments in the neighborhoods. It's going to be, you know, some more attached housing, and you know, and and, and I just on similar sized lots probably. And so I, I I understand how you feel and perceive this is going to be, but that's not how everybody does. And you need to be sensitive to how other people feel about this. Uh, and one of the things is is that. 
Uh, during the CPAC meetings, nobody was allowed to speak except for the CPAC members. Um, they are hearing about it for the first time. You have a group that is spreading knowledge, knocking on doors, telling people to come in, and look at how successful they were. We have 50 people uh, in here in the last uh, two hearings to come and talk. They may be pushing their own agenda. I, I can't, you know, I can't speak to that, but there is real concern from the residents that especially people that moved here or have lived here that like it the way that it is and that's where the nervousness comes from and that's why I just asked if CPAC has already decided hey look we've already talked about this then there's no reason to go back to the CPAC. It sounds like to, for the residents to be able to talk about their concerns about what density may feel like to them, that there's a next step for them to be able to go to. Yes. Yeah, if I could just jump in. And, um, and I, I think these are all valid points. I think people have expressed valid concerns based on their knowledge base. Um, a lot of people have not been involved and we can't involve everyone and we want people to be involved. I applaud people that came tonight, no matter how they found out about the meeting. Um, and that's what we want. We want this to be a community driven process. I think as far as the CPAC, I mean, we can, if the direction is either from planning commission or if it has to come from you know, wanting us to consult council. Um, I mean, we can reach out to the CPAC, but it's, you know, that's gonna add a month or two. I mean, we're gonna need to find a time for the meeting and then a time to actually revise the policies. I mean, it pushes out the schedule. Um, it depends on the scope of what, you know, what you think that discussion should be. If it's mainly related to neighborhood protection and neighborhood integrity, um, I'm not gonna speak for the CPAC, but I can already imagine how that discussion is gonna look. Um, I think as far as, you know, uh, information and engagement of the community when it comes to the implementation of the comp plan. Yeah, it, it's going to be incredibly important, the messaging and the information that we provide as far as what the role of the comprehensive plan is, what the role of policies are versus, hey, we're actually going to be getting in and changing the code language. Now, that's something completely different and it merits and it warrants and it requires a completely different public involvement plan. There need to be some different strategies. This, these aren't policies that we're going to be talking about. Out. This is actually code language through ordinance that then becomes the development standards. Um, so that's a different conversation to have. And so we're going to need to to establish a public involvement plan that acknowledges the concerns of, of community members and that you know ex, you know expresses the city's vision while also you know responding to some of the feedback that we've received. So you, you know the pr the primary difference on. Section 8, which has been so much of this discussion, is that it, it didn't go through the pin down process. It still had discussion at CPAC. It still had discussion at council. It still had some discussion at, at, at planning commission, planning commission and council. So, you know, we've had the hearing, we've gotten input you can work with that you know and we and the details are still coming you know the details of how you fully implement these but the policy language it's pretty it's pretty straightforward. It's not, it's not, uh, I mean, I think what you've, what, what you see in some of the comments are questions about um, compatibility and, and livability. And those are things that where they happen are at the code level primarily. And we have a lot of policies that f address those aspects yeah. of you know the, of the of the, the built environments as well and so it's not like it's just add density and don't worry about anything else you know there's policies that will shape you know the ultimate development standards so I mean it's yeah I mean there's I agree that one wasn't pinned down I would love to talk about that for hours um, that's that's kind of my thing but um, the, you know I, I don't know that it warrants going through this extra process that you know the we had discussing. enough stuff going on and the housing was 
the how I mean there were en enough issues that we just we set that one aside it was the last one to come before CPAC and it, it came um, and as we tried to accelerate the process somewhat at the, at the end um, we didn't get a chance to go through that same process but but it was we were close to the end of the process we were close to bringing them forward so it just seemed like we can roll this one forward with everything else without that pin down stage let me uh, ask that I have a sort of a clear view of the sense of the commission here is is are, are there commissioners who would be interested in reconvening the CPAC? Uh, I'm, I'm curious, does it require reconvening the CPAC? Is there another way to go about uh, providing public comment without the CPAC? I, you know, I don't know if it's, if there's any other way so that the rest of this can continue in forward motion and development. I'm, I'm not sure what you're gonna get from the CPAC. Um, I mean, are you looking for other input on these policies? You're, I, it well, seems to me that that's what's being asked for. Is yeah, and if I could just clarify on, from what I remember, it was a while ago now of Mr. Ortolano's comments during the public comment period, but uh, I think he had suggested that the CPAC reconvene and that there also be NDA members present so that there's direct neighborhood input in their discussion is what I remember. Um, and so that's something different than we're not just coordinating. We're in, we didn't formally disband the CPAC. I mean, there's still, there's been some discussion whether we were gonna have an additional meeting to talk about neighborhood hub before the CPIC really, um, you know, takes over that. And there's gonna be some continuity between the CPAC and the CPIC because up to six people can apply and be appointed. Um, but so as far as if, if, if the suggestion is that we have CPAC members, that we have NDA members, that we have other members, I mean, are those just land use chairs? Are those board members of the NDAs? Or is that anyone that wants to come and have the discussion has an equal opportunity to comment and discuss at that meeting? That's and the scope of that gets a little bit you got, large. We went out to the NDAs. We talked to the NDAs. I mean, I'm just... I think we've done the outreach. I think you've got the input, and I think you've got to kind of make some decisions. And I think that there's gonna be additional opportunities for community involvement in the follow-on CPIC for the next 18 months. Right. I'm, I mean, I think what I've heard in the, the majority of the public comments I heard were people concerned about where these additional housing types are gonna be allowed. Are we gonna have three and four story apartment complexes right next to us? And what I tried to get in my comments to the initial following the public comment period was that there isn't discussion of that within the policies. Well, right, but, but uh, I think the idea is, is that, well, hey, if we put in an 8.4 that says that, uh, you know, we keep to uh, neighborhood uh, character, neighborhood character, to neighborhood character, uh, that they feel that they are in, have a little bit more assurance that that won't happen. And you guys get to debate that. that well, you know, uh, uh, to me, we don't need to go back to the CPAC. It already sounds like the CPAC has had this discussion over and over that they came to with the policies that we have. There's no reason to go back. I was on a committee where we decided something, the public got into a public outcry, and they reconvened us to actually sit there and I had to say right in front of a big old audience and everybody else why are we here it's ridiculous so if they've already made a decision then we should not reconvene the CPAC out that my only question was to I wanted to hear staff's response and this committee's response on whether or not that was a good idea it sounds like a lousy idea the, the burden has passed to us right okay so uh I'm ready for six. Yeah, let's go to six. <laughs> um, so, uh, <coughs> 611, there was a, a recommendation for the Watersheds Council to add the words and eventually require after encourage. The, um, so, encourage and eventually require the use of innovative design and building materials that increase energy efficiency and natural resource conservation. Um, I agree with staff that uh, eventually require is toothless um, and is, is not the way that you would do that. I think that if we were going to um, consider requiring um, 
energy conservation uh, or resource conservation uh, materials or design, um, that there should have to be thresholds. And we would have to identify metric triggers uh, or metrics and thresholds that at, you know, this condition is met, now something is a requirement or now we revisit something as, you know, becomes a requirement. But rather than say just and eventually require is to, it doesn't mean anything, and I agree with staff on that point. And so if we thought that it was important to eventually require in the 20 year planning horizon, we need to establish some kind of trigger or threshold um, or call, uh, identify, create a policy that that you know instructs the city to identify thresholds to Can require. Can you say pursue the use of? I don't like pursue. Um, Can I require, I guess is my question both for Denny and for the attorney. I, I'm wondering, it goes back to my building code yeah, can we even do so that? So can I actually require? We, and I we, don't know if we I can. can't today unless, well, I, I think there's, there is one avenue where you could require it, but you'd have to renew it every year, I believe, under the building no, code. We, we also have it, that was, we have a new building code official at the state too, and I'm not, I'm also not sure where okay. that process is. So I, my caution is I just don't know if I can. Is this broader than building codes? No. You know, in this section, the built environment no, section? If it's building code, I mean, building, there's a state uniform building code, basically. Well, right, I'm aware, I'm aware of yeah. that, but when we're talking about goal 6.1, create a built environment that prioritizes energy efficiency and climate resiliency, seamlessly integrates the natural environment. That to me speaks more than just building codes. Sure. Right. That's so can you talk about, I'm open to it, can you talk about where it would be, what the requirement, what that structure is that I would be requiring? So would you be, you'd be asking development teams to somehow, um, somehow indicate that they've been pursuing or that they have innovative design and building materials in in their projects or that they've at least researched giving consideration to? Well, so we're looking at the definition over here right now. The built environment is included in the glossary. So the only other items that are in there would be infrastructure. It says yeah. open space, infrastructure. Buildings, infrastructure. It says the physical components of an environment in which people live and work, including buildings, infrastructure, streets, and open spaces. So it could be design and materials for different kinds of infrastructure or open space that increase energy efficiency and natural resource conservation and minimize negative environmental impacts. Well, it does, then it closes the sentence with building development and operation. So it seems pretty, that closing makes it read like we're talking about buildings. Well, 6.11 is yeah. about buildings, right? You know, so I thought that's where you started. Right. You yeah, know? but that's I, that goes back then to the fact that I can't. I can encourage, but I don't think I can require at this point. In, because of the building. Because it's code. the building component. Yeah. Right. I don't think pursue is require. Absolutely, I'm great with the word pursue. Are you great with pursue? <laughs> does not like pursue. Uh, I think encourage accomplishes that. Sure. And I think pursue is a better word. What, how do you how do you frame the difference between those two words? Between encourage and pursue? Yeah. But how I do you, encourage how do you, my kids to get out of bed, but, but I they must pursuing. How, how do you pursue without requiring? I need to see effort. Do you who, require who effort? that effort? <laughs> Um, pursue could be a more a active involvement on the city. It could include um, incentivize, possibly. I don't. Well, well that, per, pursue could include lobbying some efforts. Kind of reward. Like legislative lobbying efforts. You know, could you, you know, we could pursue the ability to do this thing, uh, whereas now we can't. Uh, so I mean, it does. Uh, the pursue does, uh, I guess, uh, add in my had some flexibility to um, encourage, but. Well, encourage, right, the city already encourages this by uh, giving them a, uh, an extra story on, uh, you know, in a downtown building. Uh, you could also encourage it by uh, 
um, let's say you give uh, the city starts a scholarship fund to replace old windows, um, or you could encourage a lot of things that um, I think uh, that can make this happen. I think pursue, pursue encompasses encourage in this. I, I think this is all. Can, isn't this all covered by six point one point three by working with the relevant regulatory authorities to yep. implement the requirements? There you so go. This is all Case kind of already covered. Thank you. Get the people. Who and just to complicate things further, Mr. Kraska pointed out to me that we actually have a policy and policy 5.4.4, which has very similar language, the encourage, encourage and eventually, that actually does say encourage and, and eventually require green infrastructure and development practices. Yeah, I thought I saw that. Um, so we'll want to be consistent with whatever we decide. Please, please be consistent. <laughs> I don't like the eventually required piece, but I was trying to think back to why we put that in there, the CPAC, because I, there was a reason. Uh, did well, C CPAC do that, or? You I think could they, end up in a place where in 15 years, we right. have control over building code. And I think that this would, if we had control over building code, be a clear indicator that at the time, the body was trying to get us there. I think the hard part for me is that it may, the end encourage may be after this comp plan exceeds its life expectancy because I can't guarantee that that's gonna happen before. So I, I'm okay with it. I just wanna make sure everyone knows I can encourage it today and I'm not sure I will be able to encourage it even during, or I can't require it today and I'm not sure I can require it within the lifespan of this comp plan. Require if, I uh, mean, yeah, yeah. But you can advocate at the local, state, and federal and we, level. Yeah, absolutely, and we are. Yeah. So are we good with the language as is? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think so. I just wanted to make sure that we revisited, you know, that and eventually require okay. statement to see if that did something that, first of all, we could do, and second of all, that we wanted to do. Are, are we changing uh, the other uh, one that says I think and eventually? Should. I think we should. I think we should be consistent. Yes. Did you put that one on Lauren's list? 5.4.4 and which is the one in this? 611. 611. Oh, yeah. And Chair Massey, just, um, we're going to need to have some sort of motion to extend beyond 10 o'clock. Well, yeah. okay, so let's uh, ask the question. Does the, does the, does the, uh, um, does the Planning Commission want to extend beyond? Um, I move that we extend to 1015 just to allow ourselves enough opportunity to wrap up. Okay, I agree. Second. So, did you second or you? Yeah, I know. I, I realized that I, I should have. Let me, let me I, <laughs> second. I'm pursuing. <laughs> I'm pursuing the end of this meeting. <laughs> I thought that was a question. Second. <laughs> I, it, the answer is second, yeah. Right, right. So is that a second by Burns? And, and then, um, so we, yeah. oh, I think we need to vote. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's 10. Oh. Right out of time. Aye. 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 We were three, three seconds Aye. late on that one. <laughs> Let's go on the record opposing that. Exactly. So we're trying to, we're trying to. I'm going to wait till the minutes come out. And okay, I'm going to get started on, are, can I move on? <laughs> the climate action plan, is that going to be included in the ancillary documentation section that's not? currently in print? That's correct. Yes? No. No? No. No? We weren't going to make the climate action plan an ancillary document to the comp plan. Oh, I we thought were we not. were. That you're, are you referencing it? We're referencing it. It should I, be in there. Yeah. I, I don't know why you guys are so afraid of the climate action plan. No, it's, it's going to be updated every three, three years. years it's so going to need document. to do a legislative they, amendment every It exists in its own place. I don't think we want to make uh, them go through a uh, comp plan amendment when they in, update the climate action plan. That is way more complicated. Than oh, I see, because they're updating because it's now an yeah. emergency. If we make it an ancillary document, then you have to adopt it as a plan, as a part of it, as a comp plan okay. piece. Yeah. Mm. It's okay, but it can be referenced. Reference. Can be referenced. Okay. It's a thing. Yeah. Um, six point two point one. 
Uh, increasing the quantity, quality, and variety of Milwaukee's active, I think the word alternative transportation options should be included. And then including trails, bike lanes, sidewalks, and transit. Active transportation is the preferred um, term, though. So they are no longer alternatives, because that implies that there's a Prime. preferred. OK, I can buy that. Uh, 6.2.2, we reference last mile solutions, which seems like a either a standard I'm not aware of or a quote from some. It's, yeah, it's, it's an accepted term for um, the uh, the last mile between an like industry a light rail term? station and a, yes, it is. Did we okay, put so that in the glossary? It is in the glossary. Okay, great. I need to read the glossary, I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Did you didn't get that far in the document? Commissioner Edge, can yeah. you clarify? I want to I want to go back to that 621. Uh, the definition of active transportation is actually in the glossary, and I'm going to rely on perhaps your expertise. Is transit considered active transportation? Yes and no. Because of the last mile. Um, it, it, yeah. there, in some contexts, I have seen transit included in active transportation, although I've also seen some prefer to not include it. But because when you get off the bus, you're a pedestrian, um, I, I think it, it, it's, it's acceptable to include it. OK, because it's it's currently not in the glossary under the definition of active. I mean, we can, re we can we could review um, kind of what the industry standard is for that definition. Um, and go with that and be consistent with other jurisdictions, I think, would be the best thing to do. Um, but I've seen it both ways. Okay. I, is there another place where we talk about transit? There probably is. Um, I think housing and um, urban form. I, I'm not opposed to transit. In and of itself, I just don't know. That yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure whether the preferred way would be to enumerate it separately from active transportation or not. Well, we list it. At, we define active transportation, and then we continue down with the list of what's defined in the glossary except for transit. Part of why we're asking. Oh right, yeah. I I think we ought to take it out. Actually, I don't. I mean, I don't think of active tran transportation as transit. It's something that you are. Sometimes use of transit spending. involves active transportation, but it doesn't have to because you can park and ride. Yeah. Uh, you're burning calories when you're actively transporting. Yeah, yeah I know. That's, and that's why I tend to yeah. default to it being distinct, but um, I have seen it inclusive. And I would just recommend we talk to Assistant City Manager Kelly Brooks because she is going to care desperately one way or the other. So I just want to make sure uh, from her experience that we reflect that. It seems like the intent is more so about the pedestrian level. Mm -hmm. So, it is. so I, I don't know. To me, it seems like trails, bike lanes, and sidewalks is what we're trying to improve with this. Policy. No, we're 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 trying to conserve energy, and getting people to use transit conserves energy over using um, personal vehicles. Uh, unless if there's one person. And so unless that was a separate policy where we were saying get people onto transit. Well, it, it, the way to do it, though, is to take transit up ahead of active transportation options. Okay. So it's increase the qu quantity, quality, and variety of Milwaukee's transit options or transit and active transportation options. Yeah, there you options, go. I like that. That, order. that fixes everybody's... Does that transit, when you talk about carpools, does any of that get to the, you know, it was talked about tonight was the kind of the capacity for parking at carpool stations and um, kind of max stations, which I agree is a problem. Is um. I don't. That we we talk about parking a little bit in the land use section, in land, the land use and urban design section, 
But I don't think we're specific about any, we're not specific about any particular location. Uh, 6.2.7, I, that seemed like an odd place for stormwater management systems unless I'm not understanding the intent behind this. Utility infrastructure. A utility infrastructure that conserves. Greater redundancy energy conservation and emission reduction. So prioritize natural stormwater management system. Mm, greater redundancy. As opposed to un so unnatural. Like a yeah. A this. I hear you. Oh, I, mean, I think we just talked about that. Maybe it goes under 6-1 because Yes. It's built environment? Yes. Uh, yeah, but uh, is that really energy efficiency and climate resiliency? And seamlessly integrating the natural environment? Fine. Yep. Natural stormwater natural management storm systems. Water systems. I think it belongs uh, as a 6.1.10. All right. Okay. I, I was going to suggest that in 6.2, we include something about uh, diver diversified utilities and, and storage, particularly renewable energy, 6.2.4, for example. And five. Oh, that's vehicles. Which is one way to diversify and storage. I'm sorry, can you repeat what you're looking to add on... Uh, just language that uh, supports diversified utilities infrastructure and storage of energy. Like, for example, a great place to include that would be 6.2.4. Renewable energy is... Well, can you just add storage to 6.2.4? Yeah. Or infrastructure related to. Yep. But you can't say, <clears throat> don't don't say reduce storage and barriers. Well, you want to increase storage, right? Reduce barriers to developing renewable energy projects and yeah. energy storage. And divert, yeah. And, and, yeah. Okay. I'm going to add systems behind that. Yeah, I, I agree. And we have about five minutes left on our clock. Um, I'm wrapped up on six. I don't have any more comments on six. There you go. Yeah, I don't have any green marks on my page. Any more on six? Going. We did get one chunk of public testimony that we kind of just skipped over on that, but I what? think... On six? Uh, there was a new one from the Watershed Council. Um... I mean, you're right, I didn't... Uh, and then there was one from Mr. Clark. Um, uh, I don't know, kind of saying that density causes heat islands, so... Okay, so um, <clears throat> vegetation cover had the strongest impact on temperatures, more so than building height and height width ratio. Maintaining and restoring vegetation is a key consideration in mitigating the urban heat island effects. It is not density, it is open space and vegetation. That is the, uh, and this is um, from a study, the effect of urban density and vegetation cover on the heat island of a subtropical city. Chapman et al. Can enter that into the record. Somebody hand that man a gavel. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, and so you just, uh, you don't believe in the North Clackamas Watershed Council? I think that I agree with staff that this is one of those things that might be better suited for the development code. Okay. And I'll take the heat from Neil on that one. Anything I'm not, else on I'm six? Here for them. No. Okay. Um, just a comment. So, Anne, we talked earlier on, I'm not sure what section we're talking about, but that 
Is there going to be a review? Are you going to be taking some portion of this back to staff to review um, that it's consistent with the current climate emergency? Yes. Okay, and so I can actually have six chapter six that. That really do that, and then there was one, there were two other comments, and yeah. we noted those. Are those on the list? Um, <laughs> you wrote, wrote them down, I so I'm a lot of stuff so. down. I hopefully got that. Uh, okay. But it was about two hours ago, so I'll yes. go back to that point and right. watch for your comments. Okay. Can I just say something really quick on section nine? <laughs> No. Just really nope. quick. No. no, no, no. This is this is overarching. Just for you to look at real quick. You never talk about the community service use in that section. I I don't think we need to, but I'll look. Okay. Like I said, that's an old note because maybe that's been satisfied, but you're okay. but you no longer need major master plans anymore. I'll take a look. So for uh, my clarification, uh, the next meeting is uh, no public testimony? Right. And so it's, is it a work session? No. No? You're still, still public? In the, you're still in deliberation. Okay. You're gonna continue this hearing until okay. February 11th. Okay. So it looks like we're maybe halfway, a little less than halfway? We have, can, before my time, this body has convened on a Thursday um, to continue a hearing. Um, is this, are we far enough through that we feel comfortable waiting to the 11th? Should we try Just to get so in? If, Next Thursday is the mayor's state of the city address. If, if, I think I'm gonna be there. Yeah, okay. If we're missing March 3rd, which we are, we are missing March 17th. Yeah. So our target date right now for council is a, the first meeting in April, which I will talk with the city manager and the city recorder tomorrow about scheduling, and we'll just try to see how that works. So, so right now what I'm thinking is We've probably got both meetings in February. Okay. I will also say, I think the planning director was really wise and at our last meeting put this on as 90 minutes to the council agenda for April, the first meeting in April already. So I think we've already scheduled around it. He's old and wise. Very wise. <laughs> Very old. <laughs> so I think that maybe if, if, if um, you know, if we get into dire straits, we may consider Thursday after the 11th or you know to yeah. see what we can get done in the next uh, meeting or two okay um so that we don't have to extend um beyond 10 15 do we want to um adjourn I i'd like to make a motion to continue the public hearing right don't i have to do that <clears throat> i'd like to make a motion to continue the public hearing on file so let me give you the file cpa cpa 2019-2019-001 for a date certain of february 11th second all in favor aye, aye. aye. Uh, do the commissioners or staff have any other business no. updates? I do. What? We need a planning commissioner to be assigned to CPIC and three of you, your terms expire on, the th on uh, March 31st. So I'm hoping you will all want to re-up. I'll we'll contact you. I found that out the other day when I was looking for your phone numbers. Um, <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> so we'll um, um, so I'm I'm assuming the council's not going to want to pick it, kick anybody off. But if you want to re up, you can probably get have that done. What, what's the meeting schedule for the CPEC? We haven't set it yet. I'm thinking once a month. Okay. Is what we were hoping, but not less than that. Got a lot to do. Right. Um, I will volunteer. Um, to serve on the CPEC for the Planning Commission if the, my fellow commissioners would entertain that. I would appreciate your, uh, your offer. Is anyone else interested? Do you need just one? We could have an alternate. Do those meetings go till 10 o'clock? 
we haven't had a meeting yet. <laughs> I, I, there's a lot to cover. They're going to be probably six to nine for sure. I really appreciate that. Thank you. It's important. It is terribly important. <clears throat> I would be willing to consider your backup. Okay, very good. Do we have to vote on that? I think yeah, that's, that's okay. I, accept I, I think that the chair gets to. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, review of for, future <coughs> forecast. I think we're done. Okay. I'll entertain a motion for a move. We adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank Ooh. you.